Good afternoon and welcome everyone to our virtual meeting of Brampton's Committee of Council. We will begin the meeting with the City Clerk calling the roll for attendance at today's meeting. Mr. Clerk. Members of committee, I will call your name. Please indicate your presence. Councillor Santos. Here. Chair Visante is here. Councillor Willens. Here. Councillor Pileschi. Here. Councillor Bowman. Here. Councillor Medeiros. Here. Thank you. Councillor Williams. I'm here. Councillor Fortini. I'm here. Thank you. Councillor Singh. I'm here. Thank you. Councillor Dillon. Councillor Dillon. Yes, I'm here. Thank you. And Mayor Brown. I'm here. Mr. Chair, all uh, 10 members plus the mayor are present for today's committee meeting. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. Before we uh, move to our agenda, I'd like to yield the floor to Mayor Brown. Mayor Brown. Mayor Brown, are you there? I uh, sorry if you couldn't hear me. I want to thank all council members um, for participating yesterday uh, in Blackout Tuesday. Um, we had the city and council members uh, who put a pause on their social media posts in solidarity with Blackout Tuesday. We turned off our Garden Square screen. I'm not sure if you noticed that, and turned off um, turned off the city's clock tower overnight. And every every part of the organization from uh, paramedics to police to fire to uh, the Rose Theater um, everyone was posting that blackout uh, Tuesday and we encourage everyone to take this time and space to learn and listen from Brampton's vibrant and dedicated black community Brampton is a mosaic which means that we value raise up and work with and for the diverse communities that make up Brampton as a public office holder, I'm aware of the high standard that I and others in positions of authority, trust, and power must hold ourselves to. It is a privilege I do not take lightly. I applaud the Mayor of Minneapolis, Jacob Frey, for speaking up and representing his constituents and recognizing injustice, calling it out by name, and demanding action. The footage of the last tragic minutes of George Floyd's life do not reflect how George lived. It does reflect on the devastating impact of systemic anti-black racism. And we're aware of that in Brampton. I think we have a council that's been very uh, acute to, to hearing those uh, voices. Um, I know there's some in Canada who have said there is no systemic anti-black racism. Well, they are, they are wrong, and I wanted to make that very clear. We cannot be naive about the realities in our own backyard and in Canada. We have, to, we have work to do. We, as leaders, must do heavy lifting to repair the damage and break down a trust that has impacted the relationship with marginalized communities. We all, we all must maintain, we all must listen to their voices and look at what we can actively do, not just say. I have seen the deep pain this has caused the community, and I ask you to reach, if you have members in your ward, constituents who want to um, have their voice heard. We do have a black advisory committee that meets regularly to make sure that voices are heard and any recommendation you have for someone that wants to participate, just let Francis know in my office and we'd love to get them involved to make sure their voice is heard and their voice matters. And I wanted to say this at the start of the council meeting because the, the footage we've all been seeing on television um, has shaken us and, and, and I thought it was important to start this council meeting off on this note. When it comes to um, additional items on the agenda today, I will be putting forward a motion. Um, later today, in a few hours, um, there is an op-ed that will be on the Toronto Star website and in tomorrow's paper that Mayor Crombie and myself have written, advocating for Peel Region to be the first jurisdiction in Canada to have body cameras to help build inst trust in our institutions. I believe transparency um, helps create an environment for justice, accountability. It protects the good and holds accountable the bad. Um, and we've always been on the right side of history. We always move quickly when it comes to justice. And I wanted members of council to hear 
um, that we are moving quickly on this and 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 Chief Nishan Darapa has welcomed this initiative that Mayor Crombie and myself have started and I'm it's I'm heartened to know that we live in a city in a region where there's harmony around issues like this and um, and and that's my update uh, on um, on this front. Thank you, Mayor Brown, members of committee. So we'll now move on to approval of agenda. Mayor Brown, I, I know you'd put your name up. Uh, would you like to add, remove, or change any item on today's agenda? The one thing that I would, um, there's a few other things, uh, but I, I did want to add the item and that the clerk has it, the motion and related to the body cameras. Uh, uh, and it would be, I'd be grateful for council if we could pass this motion in advance of this going live on the Toronto Star uh, website. Um, it, it, the, the article doesn't speak to um, doesn't speak to whether it has council support or not, but uh, I believe it will strengthen our position uh, if council endorsed this request for for body cameras. And so, if, if we could if we could have this vote. Uh, closer um, to the front of the agenda, um, I would be uh, grateful. Um, and I do, Councillor Vicente, I do have some amendments when it comes to the transit report, but I, I, I can do that. I've got some motions to move around that, but we can do that uh, uh, separately. I, I don't think I need to introduce that now. So, Mr. Chair, um, the mayor's proposed item would be 11.3.1 under community services section on police body cameras. And uh, as per the mayor's request, um, when that is voted on to be added to the agenda, it also could be varying the order to deal with that item after consideration of the consent motion. So early in the meeting. Yeah, if that's possible, I would appreciate council's indulgence of that. Councillor Visante, are you there? Your microphone is muted. Um, and the, the last thing I just say, Peter, um, is I've had a number of councillors uh, suggest that, that they should second this, and maybe just to show unity around this, that when it comes up, we kind of all councillors second it. Thank you. Uh, apologies, uh, Clerk, for having my mic off. Uh, so any other members of committee wish to make changes to the agenda? I have Councillor Singh. Actually, <clears throat> didn't want to make a. <clears throat> Sorry, I don't want to make a change. <laughs> Sorry. Are you okay? <laughs> Sorry about that. I'm, I'm okay. okay. <clears throat> I don't want to make a change, but <clears throat> I got um, a request from community members to make a <clears throat> a statement on behalf of the city. So, Mayor, I think you spoke eloquently and well. Um, could we just put? that statement on a letterhead so we can all share it <laughs> yeah um absolutely I'll, 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 the council yeah yeah i'll ask francis to circulate that to um to everyone thank you thank you and uh, just showing that council supports it if you need a vote but i think uh i don't think anybody's gonna uh, be against it but it was well uh done so it'd be something i'd like to share as well on behalf of uh, brenton's council thank you Councilor Medeiros. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Chair Vicente. I'd like to add um, an item regarding service delivery to the section of corporate, uh, the corporate section, corporate affairs. So, Mr. Chair, that would be proposed item 9.3.1 under the corporate services section on, on service delivery. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. Anyone else? Seeing none, we have a motion moved by Councillor Williams to approve the agenda. Instead of seeking a recorded vote for this item, we'll be asking that anyone, if there is anyone opposed to this motion, otherwise your vote will count in the affirmative. Seeing none, that carries. Thank you. Uh, In-person attendance at this meeting is severely restricted. Members and most staff are participating electronically in this meeting. The public can still access and participate in the meeting through a few measures by watching this meeting remotely through the city's live stream and playback of the archive video stream and submitting questions about the agenda business and recommendations made at committee today by emailing the city clerk's office at cityclerksoffice at brampton.ca 
with your question, which may be read into the public record during the public question period section of today's agenda. We'll move on to declarations of interest under the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act. Do any members have a declaration of pecuniary interest under the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act or for any matter to be considered on today's agenda? Seeing none, the clerk will so note for the meeting minutes. Our next item is item four, consent motion. The items listed with a star are on the agenda and are considered to be routine and non-controversial. Do any members wish to add or remove an item from the consent agenda today? Seeing none, I have here a motion from Councillor Willens to approve the consent motion. Any opposed? Seeing none, that carries. We have no announcements today. We now then move on to government relation matters. Sorry, Mr. Chair, uh, it's Peter. Yes. Um, just we, when we approve the agenda, we added the mayor's item 9.3.1 to deal with it after consent. So that would be now. So, so uh, we'll move to 9.3.1. Mayor. If uh, Peter Fake put the motion on the, on the screen. About uh, body cameras? Yes, it'll be coming up momentarily, Mr. Mayor. And if, if I could um, uh, speak to this, um, and, and if we're just going to change it to, instead of being seconded by one councillor, if it could be seconded by all of council, if everyone's okay with that. Um, if you have any objections, if you could put it in the, in the, in the, in the chat box, but I think it's important we show uh, uh, that we're united um, on this. <clears throat> a year ago, we selected a chief of police that I thought was progressive, that embraced technology we had high hopes for. He's been ahead of the curve on a lot of issues. When when much of the province um, uh, was, uh, when much of the province's police leadership was trying to insist on using carding as a, as a police a tool, in Halton, where he was at the time, he um, he was one of the first to say that carding isn't necessary, that it's akin to racial profiling. Um, he has been on the right side of a lot of these issues when it comes to uh, justice. Uh, and I spoke to him on the weekend um, after seeing those horrible scenes on TV and, and to say that we need to get ahead of the curve on this. We have to have body cameras, that transparency will drive justice, that it will inspire faith in our institutions, that it, it ensures accountability. No good police officer would not want body cameras because it protects them. Um, and uh, for me, it's, it's, it's pretty straightforward. And I was so um, uh, reassured, you know, hearing uh, his agreement with this, saying that he's already been looking into it, that there are um, technology that is, is available. I spoke on the weekend with Mayor Crombie, who was uh, uh, in complete agreement with this approach. Um, we've detailed our case for why it's time to have body cameras based on test pilot projects that have been happening in other jurisdictions in North America. Uh, and that op-ed will be in the Toronto Star later, later uh, today. But I think it would really show the unity there is in the community if our council could support this request um, that uh, we have body cameras introduced in, in Peel Police. No, 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 right I just now. wanted to give you a heads up after. But don't tell Pat or nothing, okay? <laughs> Uh, I think Councilman Madero says Mike is uh, is uh, uh, hot, but uh, um, I was going to say that Toronto has done a pilot project in 2016, and I suspect they're going to be introducing this soon as well. Um, and I would love if, if Peel Region can be one of the great examples that other municipalities can uh, can follow. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I see speakers to your motion, Councilor Santos. Thank you. Uh, point of order, I was underneath, um, this is Councillor Williams, I was underneath um, uh, the comment to asking to speak please to the motion. We have yes, a point of, mayor spoke. Uh, point of order recognized, uh, but I have a list here. I see the mayor spoke and then I see uh, speak after mayor please from Councillor Santos, You're, then yourself Councillor Fertini, 
My apologies. I didn't realize that after she wrote, what about the mayor's thing that it was speak after mayor, please. My apologies. Sorry. Thank, Thank you. you. Councillor Santos, you're, you're on the floor. Thank you. Um, through you, Chair, um, I thank the Mayor for bringing this important motion uh, forward at this time as a woman of colour and as a person um, in a position of privilege and also speaking uh, from a position of power as an elected official. Um, I have to admit and acknowledge that I do not know what it is like to be a black person right now in the country, across the world, given what has happened um, recently. And I can't even begin to think or describe what the community must be feeling right now. I reached out to Orlando Bowen, who was a well-known community leader over the weekend um, to check in and see how things are going. And actually as, as, a, as an ally and as a friend, trying to figure out what we can do and how we can make things better. And one of the things we talked about is Brampton being a progressive city, Canada being a progressive country, and some people who are saying it's not us, it's them. It's not, us. and that is absolutely not true. Um, the reason why it's not us, uh, the reason why it is also us is because when it comes to systemic racism, everybody, it's systemic racism, everyone contributes. And that's not to say that we are racists ourselves, but it is to say that even as a progressive person, we still have so much more to learn and we have so much more to listen to. And I spoke to Orlando as well about the fact that Brampton put forward an important report just before Christmas, the diversity, equity and inclusion report just before Christmas. And as a former labor person myself, I used to be with OPSU, um, Labor unions and, and, and progressives are on the front lines when it comes to social justice and, and human rights and when things like this happen. And it's part of the reason why when we passed that motion back in December, we asked our labor leaders to endorse the diversity, equity and inclusion report and recommendations because it's the right thing to do. When we talk about addressing systemic racism and when we say it's not us, it's them, this is part of the problem. We need to come together and make sure that that the diversity, equity, inclusion report is supported across the board in the city of Brampton in order to make our contribution clear that we will stand against any sort of anti-racism acts. And the final thing that I will say is I support this report completely or this, this motion completely, but having body cams is very outward facing. It's outward facing. And when situations happen like this, just like yesterday, it's a time for all of us as elected officials, as residents of Brampton, as an entire community to actually look inward and listen and to learn more. Let's come up with that list of things of how we can become better allies and how to better educate ourselves because as progressive as we think we are, we are still far from actually ending racism in our city, in our country, and across the world. We all have a part to play. So I support this, I support this motion very much. Thank you, Mayor, for bringing it forward. And to all of our Black staff and all of our residents in the Black community, I am thinking about you, I'm listening, and I have a lot to learn. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Santos. And now I move to my next speaker, Councillor Williams. Hi, thank you so much. Um, I thoroughly appreciate this motion. Um, I think uh, many of us in my community are tired, we are exhausted, um, we are frustrated, um, but we also know that we don't have the privilege to sit back and be silent. We have to get to work. And I, I think the time for action is definitely now. And I want to uh, just ensure all of the community, all of the black community who are feeling exhausted, we see you and we're going to fight and we're going to continue to push forward. Um, I, I, I actually think, you know, body cams are excellent. I think we need body cams in the Peel region and I, I really appreciate the effort the, and the work that's being done by our mayors, Bonnie Crombie and Mayor Brown to put this forward to the police board. It's the right thing to do. Um, but I, I really do think we need to go further. I, I have residents here in Brampton who 
don't just live in Ontario and in, in Brampton and they they go to Hamilton they go to London they go to all over Ontario to meet families and so the call for body cams across Ontario is needed and I, I'm pushing for that I want to see us have body cams all across Ontario and um, you know there is we know anti-black racism is a reality in Brampton it's a reality in Ontario and in Canada and the question is what are we going to do about it you know police and the black community the relationships they're not on the best footing at this time and I don't believe body cameras will solve all of the problems in the world but it will it is definitely part of the solution and it will improve police accountability you know in Las Vegas Nevada um, studies demonstrated that there was a marked decrease in the use of force complaints and an increase in the arrest rates you know those statistics suggest that cameras help make police officers better at their jobs and I, I think this is what we want I think all of us want to feel safe all of us want to have that accountability and all of us want to see that change and I fully support having this and I I've heard from the community that we need to push this broader and I've heard from the community that they want to put their voice and add their voice to this push um, so I, I am working with the community there's a petition out there right now and I want to encourage everyone who doesn't know how to support doesn't know how to reach out sign your name um, sign your name on the petitions um, at bodycamsforcops.com and be a part of this movement. The time is now. And I, I want to in, encourage us to really also look at, you know, the way, oh, the way a corporation or a system treats the people internally is an indication of how people are going to be treated externally. So when we look at the diversity and inclusion um, policy that's been created, you know, there are definitely pieces that we need to be moving on. Um, the, the request for resource um, groups within the city to help support the employees within the city of Brampton. Uh, the questions that are coming up, when are we going to see more black staff hired as full-time employees? When are we going to see more black staff here at the city of Brampton? What is the hiring process? When are more young black people going to see themselves in these positions? You know, these are the questions that we really need to start looking internally on how we're going to solve this and look at how our micro microaggressions are happening to people here in our in our corporation. And I am so thrilled that we are thrilled because I, I feel now is a is a time. There's been such a movement and a shaking and 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 you know, it's empowered me and I take strength from many of the leaders who are out there. You know, what choice do I have but to push on, to keep on making those changes and keep on bringing the voices of many of those who are in our community to to the forefront. And uh, so I think that this is a good movement and um, I'm in full support. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Williams. Next I have Councillor Fertini. Thank you through the chair and thank you to Patrick Brown, our mayor, and Bonnie Comby. I know this is long overdue and uh, I'm well supportive of it. Uh, I'd just like to know if we could take it one step further and uh, maybe look into looking into our bylaws because we're facing a lot of problems with them too. Maybe if we could add uh, to also get cameras for our bylaws for our city because they do almost the same thing and they're, they're facing problems too. Uh, I'd like to make an amendment on that motion if it's possible, or maybe we wait for the budget and see what we have to do for this. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Fertini. Um, I think that uh, that would be something that we could uh, bring up as a separate motion, but uh, this is a very important and uh, specific motion that supports uh, Mayor Brown and Mayor Crombie's requests uh, to Peel Regional Police Services. Your request is more to do with the city. Uh, would you like to bring that up as a separate item? Well, this is a regional issue and we're talking about it at the city uh, and I'm supportive of it. I think it's good that we all uh, second the motion because yes, uh, like Ruana Santos said, you know, she did said absolutely right and kill, uh, Mayor Brown, but you know, just extend it to maybe bylaws because they're also facing a lot of problems and we've seen what happened with bylaws uh, the problems we've been facing now, and then when we have it on camera, it's a, it would be a lot better to you know just see how they're doing their job. But I, that's fine, and 
just maybe we could add it on the next budget for the following year. Thank you. Very good. Thank you, Councillor. I have a question from Councillor Singh. Councillor Singh. Yeah, more so uh, just um, wholeheartedly support this. I actually had uh, discussions around uh, body cams over the weekend uh, with members of the community. So I'm very uh, happy that uh, the mayor and uh, well, both mayors have moved on this promptly. Um, and I would also support Councillor Fertini's suggestion um, to bring this into uh, bylaw. We don't have to do it right now, but uh, it's something uh, I look forward to discussing uh, further and I'm definitely open to it. So thank you. Thank you, Councillor Singh. Seeing no other speakers, members of council committee, we have a motion on the floor. Is anyone against? S seeing none, that carries. Thank you. Thank Mr. You, Chair, Mayor Brown. Just, just as we proceed, I just want to advise committee that I think we're having an issue with the live stream that we're trying to rectify, but I believe we are still recording, so we'd still proceed with the meeting. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. So members of the committee will now move on to government relations updates. Gurdip Kaur is here with a presentation for committee on government relation matters. Thank you, and through the chair, I will go over some federal and provincial announcements that have come up since the GR update was distributed to council last week. Slide two, please. Thank you. On Monday, the federal government announced what we hope is only the first step in financial support for municipalities to address the impact COVID-19 is having on communities by accelerating the delivery of the federal gas tax. Well, this is not new money. What this does mean for the city is that we will have access to both our local and regional share in June. For context, our 2019-2020 share was approximately 33 million between both the local and regional portions of the gas tax. The city, along with FCM, BC, MC, and AMO, are continuing to push both the federal and provincial governments for more emergency financial support. The government's also launched a short consultation on the Canada Emergency Wage Subsidy, which closes on the 5th of June. This survey can be accessed through the Department of Finance. We are also working with the economic development to ensure Brampton businesses are aware of this current opportunity. Slide three, please. Thank you. Yesterday, the government extended the provincial declaration of emergency until June the 30th. The Premier has made it very clear that the extension does not mean that reopening is on hold. Rather, the government also introduced a fixed electricity price of 12.8 cents per kilowatt hour between June the 1st to October 31st, along with the following measures. Nine million for the COVID-19 Energy Assistance Program to support consumers struggling to pay their energy bills during the pandemic, the program will provide one-time payments to consumers to help pay down any electricity bill debt incurred during the COVID-19 period. Eight million for the COVID-19 Energy Assistance Program for small businesses to provide support to businesses struggling with bill payments as a result of the outbreak. Additional information will be provided on both of these programs when it becomes available. On Monday, the province also announced that it was enacting a new regulatory amendment that puts non-unionized employees on infectious disease leave during COVID-19 outbreak when their hours are temporarily reduced by their employer. And what this does is it will ensure businesses aren't forced to terminate employees after ESA temporary layoff periods have expired. Slide four, please. Thank you. Since the publication of the GR update, the Region of Peel has since provided the static map showing the rate of COVID-19 cases in Brampton, the, sorry, in Peel. The region, uh, the information is available at www.peelregion.ca slash coronavirus. Thank you, and I'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Those are all the updates we have for this week. Councillor Visante, uh, if you can turn your mic on, please. Going back to, uh, we have a motion 
I see no questions, so we have a motion moved by Councillor Dillon to receive the report. Is anyone opposed? Seeing none, that carries. We can now move on to item 6.2 and updates on the COVID-19 emergency. Mayor Brown has been providing regular updates uh, to council committee at our meetings, and I would like to now invite the mayor to provide an update to committee today. Mayor Brown. Uh, thank you, uh, Councillor Vicente. So an update since the last uh, week. Um, first of all, um, I want to thank uh, Councillor Michael Pileschi for helping me with the weekly press uh, briefing uh, today. We also had Chief Nishan Dirapa uh, with me and, um, and Dr. Lowe. Um, Dr. Lowe talked about the fact we continue to have community spread. Um, particularly amongst the age group of 20 to 29, we need to get young people to really, really jump on um, the importance of physical distancing and the advice from public health. Um, it does continue to be uh, a problem. Just in the last week, we had 19 more uh, backyard parties, nine tickets for cricket games, whether it's soccer or cricket or basketball. We have to embrace physical distancing. Half the new cases on one day on the weekend were just from the age group of 20 to, to 29. So, you know, we, we don't have the severity of the cases in, in Mississauga in terms of um, the, the death rate, but uh, the fact that we're allowing the cases to continue to spread in the community is reckless. And so uh, I need our, everyone in council's help helping educate young people in our community that although it may not hit them as severely, Your call has been forwarded to an automatic voice messaging system loved ones um, in, in their community. is not available. At the tone, please Someone's record your message. Somebody leave a callback send... number, press 5. If, if we're done, who's ever leaving the message for Paul Morrison, maybe there was a bylaw um, incident they wanted to report. I will continue with my update. Um, uh, Chief Nishan uh, talked uh, about um, our project a race. We, we've been running a project which is eradicating uh, street racing in our community um, or street racing every, everywhere. That's the acronym for a race. Um, they impounded nine cars last week. Um, nine, nine people lost their cars for street racing um, on these targeted um, uh, police enforcements and we're going to continue them. So for those who think that the pandemic is an excuse for street racing, you will lose your car. So if you're going to be an idiot, if you're going to uh, risk uh, the safety of, of the community by street racing, you're going to lose your car and you're going to face criminal charges. Um, the chief was very clear about that, uh, about that today. The other update I, I should give is we're really trying to ramp up testing. I've been talking to the premier, uh, the, um, our medical officer of health, and Dr. Naveed Mohammed. We're looking at having uh, mobile testing at some of our workplaces but we're also working on a drive-through um, location. And so the hospital uh, staff have been working with our city staff on a potential location for a drive-through testing um, uh, location. I'm not sure if the location is finalized, so I won't say it uh, yet. Um, David Barrett can actually know what we, we should let the hospital announce it when it's, when it's appropriate. But we're trying, to make, we're trying to make testing more accessible and more available, testing, testing, testing enables community tracing. Testing, testing, testing allows us to track where the virus is spreading. And part of the challenge we have in Brampton is because we live in, in a dense area with multiple families being common, it spreads faster. And so it's why having a handle of where it starts is so critical so we can uh, track it before it gets out of hand and isolate it. So that's a quick update in terms of uh, uh, where we stand this week compared to uh, last week. Thank you, Mayor Brown, for that update. I have a question from Councillor Bowman. Thank you very much through you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you for the update. Um, I'm asking if uh, we can go ahead and ask for more detailed information from Peel Region. It took them I guess uh, seven to eight weeks before they would finally give us the data on postal codes, for example. Um, but I, I, I love data, but I love to make sure the data is right when we get it. And I'd like to see the data for all of Peel Region broken down by category, Brampton and Mississauga and Caledon. And what I mean by that is 
you know, we, we know that certain postal codes are hot spots. We discussed that. We know that certain age groups, and I hate to sound like a broken record, but the 20 to 29 year old age group um, is the highest in Peel region than anywhere in Canada. I'd like to see that further broken down. I, I, I want to get the stats that tell us the demographics broken down by postal code. So if, uh, if in uh, a certain postal code, we may find out that the vast majority of those people who are infected are in fact the 20 to 29 age group. And I think that's important for us to know um, because when the numbers are combined with Mississaugas, we may not be targeting the right people. Uh, we may not be targeting the right advertising. We may not be trying to get the message out to the correct individuals that we need to get that message out to. So I would like to know if you can ask Peel for a complete breakdown by demographic for every postal code we have. Mayor Brown, do you wish to address the question? Um, Councillor Bowman, I've asked uh, Peel Public Health for that data as well. They seem to be slow in releasing um, precise data like that, but I will continue to, to, to push them. I also want to know that the, the testing numbers per region. You know, I like to know how many tests we've done with Brampton residents versus Mississauga residents uh, or Caledon. Um, and so the more information we have, the better the tools we have to, to react. And so, um, as you know, at the beginning of this pandemic, I said our best tool is going to be transparency, and I continue to believe that. Um, I know right now it's a position of public health that we do not disclose the location of outbreaks. You know, I'd even go a step further than wanting to know the the, the uh, greater detail and breakdown of the postal codes. I love it if at the locations of of where there's been outbreaks was public. I know they're balancing privacy rights, but I think there's a, an obligation to the public to make sure we're completely transparent with them. Um, and I will continue to push uh, public health on that. Okay, thank you very much. And the, the other thing is that the numbers are may be deceiving because we don't know if there's multiple um, cases of, of COVID-19 in the same household, in the same postal code. So. You know, we don't even know if uh, if a certain house and a certain postal code may have seven cases, eight cases. And so, I think that's important. Yeah, so I can help with that, Councillor Bowman. It, it, I'm told it is typical that when that we've had a number of cases in Brampton where it's multiple families, uh, multiple individuals in the same household. Um, it's not people living in separate units in, in a house. It's when you have three generations living together. So it's not necessarily the basement apartments. It's having you know a grandfather, family, and grand and grandkids all living together. We've had some cases where 15 people in the same house have have tested uh, positive. Yeah. Okay. And and one and sorry sorry, Mayor. One more thing. Um, Ottawa and Montreal have both passed bylaws about mandatory wearing of masks. Are we looking at that, or are we considering that for uh, for the future? So I, I don't believe that's in municipal jurisdiction. That may be an advocacy uh, resolution, um, but uh, because Consumer and Commercial Affairs is a provincial jurisdiction, we could pass it, but it's not something that, that we, um, I, I don't believe we can enforce. But maybe uh, if uh, Joe Pertari or Paul Morrison is on uh, the call, they, they could speak to that. The more people that wear the mask, the better. Um, I you know, absolutely it, agree, yeah. yeah. Thank you, Mayor. And you know, I, I think you're absolutely right. The um, there are limitations in terms of what we can do as a city. Uh, we need to be concerned with uh, so other pieces of legislation, the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, that you know prohibit us from you know doing such enforcement activities. So um, it, it does require some more research, and we're open to doing that research and bringing something something back to council to consider. Okay, uh, thanks very much, Joe. And even if it's just on transit, I mean, we are we have a declared emergency, so it may negate some of the some of the uh, legislation and jurisdictions. So that'd be worth looking into. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Bowman. Councillor Medeiros. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, and I guess, uh, Mayor, if you can uh, maybe touch upon. 
uh, or staff. Um, so we've seen on social media some plazas uh, and Councillor Bowman in my area and uh, uh, over there by uh, McLaughlin and, uh, and Steeles, some of the plazas. Uh, I've had uh, sort of community leaders reach out to me about, um, you know, is it possible about we increase our, our bylaw presence, our, our enforcement officers. Uh, and I think there's still um, a misunderstanding of what our role is, what we can do or not do. Um, and even myself sometimes uh, understand that some of these plazas, um, you know, that, that we do have jurisdiction in terms of giving tickets to uh, where people are not respect of social distancing. Um, but again, I'm not sure if our capacity is there because it seems to be increasingly happening. And uh, again, I keep getting social media posts uh, sent to me about uh, this is happening, here's this, is there anything we can we do? So I guess my first question would be, um, you know, to staff is, uh, do we have a capacity issue? Is there not, um, you know, would we recommend increasing uh, uh, bylaw officers or enforcement officers? Uh, and uh, uh, would that sort of help? And second, in terms of budget impacts, is this not something that we can tap into? Uh, um, you know, is this something that the provincial or federal government could help us uh, from a budgetary perspective if we had to invest more enforcement? Uh, and uh, and then after dealing with private uh, um, plazas in terms of how we can uh, uh, sort of monitor, because that seems to be where those a lot of those kids from or a lot of youth from that 20 to 29 years seems to be in parking lots and, and stuff like that. <coughs> yeah, um, great question, Councilor Maduros. Yeah. Uh, and um, maybe Paul Morrison um, could speak to, or Joe, or Joe Patari, if additional resources are required. Um, I would note we have added 10 bylaw officers, but um, Commissioner Patari. Uh, or, or uh, Paul Morrison, do you believe we require additional um, bodies? Through the mayor, through you, Mr. Uh, sorry, go ahead, Paul. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, sorry, my Skype was failing. Um, we are at capacity now. Um, we are unable right now to, to do all of the regular work we're doing. Um, if COVID calls do go down, then we can re-engage in our old work and, and do some of that. Uh, so, so I think we're just at a threshold. I think we can sustain what we have going right now for the next little while. Uh, if the ministry changes the rules on inspections, et cetera, and downloads more responsibility, then we'd have to have a new conversation. Maybe that's something we can look at and we could get a report next week on whether it, if there's additional um, uh, resources required and, and, and council could consider that. Absolutely. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Medeiros, are you done? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Medeiros. Uh, I see no more speakers on this item, so I have a motion from Councillor Medeiros to receive this update that the update from Mayor Brown regarding COVID-19 emergency to the Committee of Council meeting of June 3rd, 2020 be received. Is there anyone opposed? Seeing none, that carries. So members of the committee, we'll now move on to delegations, item 7.1. A presentation from KPMG regarding the capital project management assessment checkpoint and path forward. KPMG has been engaged by the city at the request of City Council to review the city's capital projects program. Joining us today from KPMG, we have Janet Rekis, Alderman for KPMG Partner, Sol Gimarines of Senior Manager, Karen Chada, Manager, and Stephen C. Beattie, Global Chairman, Infrastructure and Chairman for City Center of Excellence. Welcome and please proceed with your presentation. Janet, are you there to start the presentation? Mr. Chair, it's showing her is not uh, is connected, but her microphone and video are not active at the moment. So, Karan, I don't know if, if you wish to uh, start the presentation while Janet gets connected. Uh, 
Uh, thanks, Peter. Uh, I just messaged Janet. Let's just give her a minute or two. She might be having some tech issues and see if she can reconnect. Okay, thank you. Hi, Peter. I just received a message from Janet. Uh, she's there, but uh, could you activate her speaker? It may be that, that uh, you, there's been a mute hall going. So, Mr. Chair, uh, we do see Janet Alderman in the meeting as an attendee, but uh, her microphone and her video is grayed out. Um, I don't know if, if it looks like it's been deactivated on her end. Um, what do you recommend? Do you recommend we recess until we uh, can determine what is wrong? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, perhaps if somebody else from the delegation can, can start or if they feel that it's important that Janet be to lead off the presentation, then uh, perhaps we can move on to another item and then come back to this as opposed to a recess. Okay. Our next item then is the economic development and culture section. We can move on to that. Uh, there are no staff presentations or reports or new business. And uh, there is no correspondence. So we'll move on to item 8.5, counselor question period for the section. Any members of council? Have any questions with regards to the economic development and culture section on today's agenda? Yes, we have Councillor Santos. Councillor Santos. Sorry, no, I, I have no questions. I was just saying yes to moving on and uh, dealing with KPMG after. Okay, Councillor Fertini, you have a question? Yeah, going back since we talked about this, maybe I'd like to put this motion forward today to look into the bylaws for the cameras and vests. As of our, our municipality, all our bylaws have no no security vests, no cameras, nothing. Maybe I, it would be a good thing to bring it forward now. Uh, to put the motion to look into it, and I know it's a budget thing, and if we have to wait for the budget, uh, that's fine. But I'd like to put a motion forward now to to bring it forward. Thank you, Councillor Fertini. I just uh, defer to the clerk. Would this be an appropriate time to bring up this motion, or should we handle it in another section? Through you, Mr. Chair, um, in enforcement and bylaw services is normally um, handled under the corporate services section, so I would recommend if committee wishes to reopen the agenda to add a new business item, which would be 9.3.2 on body cameras for enforcement and bylaw services staff, then it could be addressed at that appropriate time. Uh, I would recommend, I see some co some comments here that we should add it to the corporate services section. Would you, uh, would anyone be opposed to us adding this discussion item by Councillor Fortini on cameras for bylaw to the corporate services section of today's agenda? I see none. I see none. Mr. Clerk, do we need a two-thirds vote? Uh, Mr. Chair, yes, you do. Okay, so we'll ask for a recorded vote on adding this item to the agenda, so it's work clear. So a recorded vote has been requested to add a, the additional item from Councillor Fortini. All in favor, please indicate. Councillor Santos? Yes. Counsel Chair Vasante? Yes. Councillor Willens? Yes. Councillor Pileschi? Yes. Councillor Bowman? Yes. Councillor Medeiros? Yes. Councillor Williams? Yes. Councillor Fortini? Yes, of course. Councillor Singh? Yes. Councillor Dillon? Councillor Dillon? Uh, Mayor Brown? Yes. Thank you. Councillor Dillon, are you there? 
So, Mr. Chair, um, Councillor Dillon appears to be absent. I'll confirm if there is a technical issue. Otherwise, it, it carries uh, 10 to 0 with one absence. Okay, so we'll uh, be discussing that a little bit later in today's agenda. Um, I see that uh, Janet may be back on. Uh, are we able to... Sorry, can uh, you hear me? Uh, Go ahead, Janet Kat. is here. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Oh, wonderful. I'm not sure what happened Sorry. there. Sorry, Chair Vicente, it's Councillor Dillon. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, yes. I, I was trying to speak, but I was muted. And how did you vote on that motion? Uh, in favor. Okay. Thank you. So noted by the clerk. Uh, so uh, we now have KPMG back online. So if we can, let us uh, move with that uh, report and that presentation. Janet Rikus Alderman, KPMG partner. Please proceed. Hi. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so starting with, uh, if you can move the slide forward, please, to slide number two. Thank you. Uh, so as we introduced, where I'm here with my colleagues, and so we're on slide number three. So the, the purpose of this presentation is to provide you an update with the work that we have been performing, um, first phase one, and it will be followed by phase two. So the focus of our phase one was based on an immediate uh, ask from council at the time that we did the work to review the open and outstanding projects from 2016 and prior, and I'll go through which ones those were to determine if the activities, there was activities that could be closed immediately and funds returned for the funding sources respectively. The focus of our phase two, which is upcoming, will be, will be perform a more fulsome review of the city's capital project processes and procedures to meet with relevant stakeholders to determine how projects are identified and approved and monitored and how the project status is communicated with stakeholders. We move to the next slide, please, the executive summary. Uh, to summarize our findings, um, the, the reasons, just before I start, I'd just like to say the reasons for the projects remaining open and funds unspent actually as we go through the presentation were within the bounds of reasonableness. And I feel that there was an understanding of, techno of terminology that was uh, very key to our understanding, I believe the understanding of, of uh, others. Um, to, uh, to determine why those projects were open. So to summarize, uh, the report summarized that there was 509 active capital projects open as of June 30th, 2019 with a total budget of 908.2 million, of which 744 million in funds remained unspent and uncommitted. The report, uh, the report at Council of the Committee dated September 19, uh, September 18, 2019. So what we did was we, uh, the focus of this was really active projects from 2016 prior. So of that, there was $113 million. So that was your projects 2016 prior. Um, when, so that was our, our, our focus. So when we looked at the, uh, the projects in that, uh, we determined that there was 9.2 million of funds to be returned, 10.5 million to be reviewed, the total funds not to be returned, which were 93.6 million, and that all added up to the, 1 point, uh, the 113 million. Okay. Um, if we go to slide five. So this is really the background slide, just to remind everybody the, 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 um, the genesis of, of the request. There was a report in Q, uh, dated September 18th from uh, Q2 2019. If you recall of that, there was 509 active projects, $744 million that was, was labeled unspent and uncommitted. Uh, so therefore, city had passed a resolution and, and that is how we, we uh, became engaged. Slide six. Um, so this was the, the objectives, which you will probably recognize from the scope uh, council meeting document. The, the objective of our first phase was, was really point number one, to maximize the limited financial resources by freeing up capital funds not immediately required. Phase two will encompass 
um, items two, three, and four. Okay. I will, if you, I will go through this next section, which I think is important uh, through our review because one of the things that we determined was um, the terminology is very important. So, so I think some of the questions was why were there projects uh, that were potentially open for years? Why were they not being closed? But the first of all, if we go through uh, number slide number nine. Could advance, please. So, uh, advance again, please. Yes, thank you. So, project portfolio. So, the first thing to understand is that the project number is assigned to both a project or an asset purchase. Um, it might even be assigned to a study being performed. So, any kind of capital expenditure would be assigned a project portfolio number. And as you can see, it could be street lighting or it could be a bus purchase. If you go forward to slide 10, again, this is to align everyone. The other important activity, the important factor to understand, uh, appreciate too, is that a project, so you'll see in this figure case, has the first two digits, uh, 14, which is the year that the project is open. Then it will have the, the project number. And then the number on the end, the 001 you're seeing, is an activity. And so in order for a project to be completely closed, all activities are, must be uh, completed and closed. And there's a number of reasons why a project activity could be open. Even if the project is 99% complete, um, if there are outstanding activities, maybe claims or a piece of that project that's not complete, um, it is quite possible that that project would remain open until all of those activities are complete. And if you move to slide 11, this gives you a couple of examples. So you can see in these two examples how you'll have a project such as street lighting would have a number of activities, parent-child uh, activity uh, exists and would have to be closed before the whole project is closed. Um, are we still showing the, the presentation to everyone? It seems to have, can people still see the presentation? We can see it. Please continue. Yep. continue. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So I'm now on slide number 12. So financial terminology. Um, again, just to align everybody, a total project budget includes both a purchase order, which is the committed funds. So once funds are committed, a PO is is issued. You have then spent funds. So these are the funds, obviously, that a PO has already been uh, been issued and the work has been completed. And then you have the remaining unspent and uncommitted funds. And this was the area of focus of our review. Um, slide number 13 is activity status. So as part of our review, we also looked at the scope of the projects we looked at. We, we determined what was the status, so what was uh, open, in service, or closed. And you'll see further on through the presentation, uh, we provide a summary of the status of each of the projects. Um, if we go to slide number 15, 14 and 15, 15 please, which is our approach. So again, we obtained a list of the com complete list of the active projects from 2016 prior. We then interviewed management to gain an understanding of the project tracking process. We met with management to obtain reasons for each of the projects being open. And then we performed a high-level analysis of which categories the project fell into to determine the root causes for why they were opened. Uh, slide 16 um, provides you with, uh, with the dates and who uh, with the department or division that we, we spoke with. And i also like to point out that we did perform a line-by-line -line review of each of the open project activities, so the projects and the activities from the 2016 prior by department. So if we move into uh, slide, uh, going through slide 17 is the title slide, and slide 18 is the findings. So here, this slide breaks down, provides a breakdown of the unspent funds from 2016 and prior and explains why some of the funds um, 
could, were not returned and funds that need, uh, need further review. So, for example, um, of the $113 million in projects we looked at, we found that $9.2 million were funds could, that should be returned as per the inputs of the respective operating departments. So those, those were funds that either were on their way to be returned or, or um, were in the course of that. There was 10.5 million which were to be reviewed. So uh, for example, um, they, they would have been included projects that were currently in review with the finance department. There were some with no commitments and no financial activities, relatively small, 2% of that 113 million. So we did a breakdown as to, as to the status of each of those um, projects. And funds not to be returned was the largest bucket, which was 93.6 million. And as you can see, a large part of that 33 million had to do with uh, a specific project, which was the Goreway Drive widening project. Um, also funds not to be returned, you can see some of the reasons there. So partnerships with other parties, uh, work in progress, projects under warranty or litigation. So all um, regular reasons within the bounds of reason as to why that, that, um, that money was still there. Um, I won't spend a lot of time on slide 19 or 20, but on 19, and I believe this, this information is in your package, um, breaks down, it's a bar chart, chart showing the completion status for active capital projects and act activities for the projects prior to, uh, approved in 2016 prior. So the first bar showing the total uh, active capital projects, second bar showing the activities within those projects, total activities, and the third bar shows the activities that can be closed, and the fourth bar showing activities that can be open. So just provides you a little bit of more analysis there. Um, the status of the funding. So on this particular slide, we are showing you uh, the funding status for the active projects and the activities for the project approved 2016 and prior. And then finally, on slide uh, 21, of the monies that are to be returned, we did uh, an analysis of of what are the sources of funding? So where are those going back to? So as you can see, uh, see those sources. Okay. Um, finally, on slide uh, 22, um, this was included at the time. There was I, we had a question regarding considerations for project timing. I think that there was some questions regarding, um, you know, if if a project is approved and it takes a while for the project to start, uh, does it typically cost more? And uh, so we just put together some uh, some considerations there. Of course, uh, in in typical times, if you think about things like the construction price index, that typically is does go up. Um, but of course, any sort of um, uh, any sort of time between a project being being approved and when it's actually initiated, you have some uncertainty. So, so that time creates some uncertainty. Sometimes it creates opportunity for uh, better prices. Sometimes it creates um, some some um, worse, worse worse price positions. So, so just a couple of of considerations um, that we were asked to provide. Finally, I will go to next steps, and then I believe you'd like me to pause for questions. So on slide uh, 24, it really talks about phase two. So phase one was really focused on um, those 2016 prior projects, but phase two is really about more the, more the overall way of how does the city um, identify projects, how do they come into the system, how, what's the time frame when they get approved, and then how are they tracked um, from the time they're approved through to execution and then close out. And we will um, review those against um, industry leading uh, practice uh, and we'll come back with some recommendations. We anticipate that uh, piece of work it will uh, start um, immediately, um, providing we, we, uh, there's no adjustment to that scope uh, based on this discussion, 
and that that phase would take somewhere between 8 to 12 weeks. So maybe I'll, I will pause there. Okay, thank you very much, Janet. Uh, I have a number of questions from members of committee. First up, I have Councillor Medeiros. Councillor Medeiros. Uh, thank you, through you, Chair, and thank you, uh, I believe, Janet, for the, the presentation. Uh, I guess when you look at, you know, and I appreciate uh, um, all the sort of information that is given, all the technical information that is provided, and, um, you know, it's a lot of, uh, uh, information to consider, but just in general commentary, how would you say that we're doing uh, in terms of, uh, um, you know, after your, uh, in terms of the capital review, um, can you just, you know, in a general comment, how are we doing in terms of if you were to do a scorecard? And I know it's hard to simplify, but can you just provide more sort of generic comments, a little bit more high-level comments, uh, just so for people out there who are uh, trying to follow this presentation and, and just for uh, us to get an understanding, if you were to sort of give us more of a, a high-level, um, you know, more generic comments in terms of uh, the state of uh, uh, affairs when it comes to our capital, uh, when it comes to our uh, uh, capital review, the capital review that you just uh, completed. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, okay, so first of all, uh, phase two is really going to look at your processes, right? So, so your processes to manage and control your projects. When I look at um, the big thing that, that I take away from the work that I did was probably communication between what is an open project and um, when is a project closed, right? And so I think that um, when I look at phase two, I'm really going to be looking at communication and reporting and is there a better way to communicate um, the current status of projects. No, and, and thank you because that, that seems to be uh, – uh, sometimes for us uh, difficult because we approve um, capital investments and then in terms of project updates um, you know there's always a discre discrepancy of you know what's been closed out what hasn't been closed out so even for us so I, I think that's a, an important takeaway to sort of understand um, that when we make you know some of these capital investments and when the projects are done uh, that there is that sort of communication on uh, what's been ongoing what's actually closed out uh, and that helps us uh, sort of uh, um, organize our assets and our investments uh, uh, a little bit easier. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Medeiros. Next, I have Mayor Brown. Thank you, uh, Councillor um, Vicente. And I uh, found this uh, report very uh, interesting. I'm glad we've done this exercise. But you know, looking at some of the numbers, I made a note here. Uh, to be returned 9.2 million dollars that's great you know we, we talked about this this significant amount of over 100 million dollars for projects that were quite dated and the initial premise of this conversation was if a project that was uh, significantly old um, never happened do we necessarily need to do it today and by looking at this 9.2 million is being returned um, which, which we can use on other infrastructure projects or other city uh, projects. Uh, 10.5 is to be reviewed. That's almost 20% of, of, the, uh, of the total budget that they were looking at. So that's, that's encouraging. I think this has been a healthy um, exercise. Um, if I could just ask um, again, and sorry if Theodore is a little uh, vocal in the background, uh, the benefits of doing uh, uh, the advantages and disadvantages of doing council uh, at at home. Um, did did this team of KPMG look at um, at all these projects and and really analyze? Is it still worth um, the intended purpose? Like, did you did you, did you do any analysis of of that? But I know some of these projects, and remind me, because I know we, we first talked about this a long time ago. The first time we talked about this was maybe eight months ago or longer. Uh, how, how dated were some of, these, some of these projects? If I recall, wasn't, weren't some of them from seven or eight, six, seven, eight years ago? Um, so the question is, how dated were some of these projects? And, and the second part of the question is, did you look at all projects, whether it still serves the intended purpose? Yeah. Um, so, Karan, if you could just look up some of the dates of the further back 
projects, um, and I'll just answer part two. Uh, so we did we did not look at the um, uh, whether the project uh, was still uh, viable or worthwhile or whatever the objective that you might measure by what we did do was um, a query with management on the reasons for it still being opened. So, um, uh, so, so, so not, I think, quite what uh, no to your, your second part. Um, and the first part, Karan, what are, just provide me some of the, the five or six of the dates of the longest open projects, please. Yep, sure, Janet. So the the earliest project that we looked at was uh, uh, was from 2001, and after that there were some from 2004, 2006, all the way leading up to 2016. Thanks, Janet. I, Thanks. I think it's worth going back to the slide where it shows why <laughs> were they still open. It could have been because of claims. It could have been because of, of warranty issues. It could have been because they were long-term maintenance projects. I think that's a, <laughs> important. It's an important distinction to make, and it's the issues around the the the, the logic within your accounting system. That's the slide. It, yeah, yeah, that's on. a good. Thank you. Sorry, I, I didn't hear the, the the dates on that again. What what were some of the They went oh, as far so, back as the, the oldest one, I think, was 2000, uh, 2001. 2001. So we had some yes. projects that were 19 years old. Yeah, and it could have been, for instance, Mayor, um, it's Steve, um, it could have been that there was a claim outstanding and it was going through the ju judicial process. Your accounting system won't, won't close that until that issue is solved. So it's not that the project hasn't been done, it's that there still remains something in the past to close it. Okay, what was the oldest for a project that um, not something that was held up in, in the in the judicial system? Uh, what, what would have been the the, the longest we've had an infrastructure project uh, sitting on the books? I, I'm without uh, going back with further analysis. I I'm not sure, Karan, We actually have that picked out. I, do, do I just uh, I was just looking at the list, Janet. So. Uh, there is one from 2004, which was the Torbrum CNR uh, grade separation, and that one is one of the ones which is a third-party partnership with City of Mississauga, and it was currently in litigation. Okay. Yeah, and so I guess what I'm saying, I, and I'll, I'll delve deeper in, into this uh, report, but what I was interested in is if projects were done uh, budgeted 15 years ago and we haven't completed them does it still serve the intended purpose is this good use of taxpayer dollars and and, and that was the genesis behind wanting this report was to always put us ourselves in the in that viewpoint is this the best use of taxpayer uh, resources? We have so many things we want to do with the electrification of the new bus terminal to active transportation. Like we've got ideas left, right, and center on this council uh, of what we want to do in Brandon. We're just going to need to make sure that every expense we allocate is is, is justified, and um, and that's why I think this has been a healthy process, and and hopefully, our, our the managers involved in these projects, city staff uh, who are on this call are asking that same question and and if there was a project allocated a long you know, 12 years ago um, if it's not necessary today I'm sure we could find uh, um, good use for those precious uh, resources so thank you to the KPMG team to, for, for looking at this and uh, um, I'm, I look forward to hearing the other questions thank you mayor Brown uh, next have uh, councillor Bowman Councillor Bowman Thank you very much through you, uh, Chair Vicente. Um, I, you know, I, everybody knows how much I love consultants and and when we use them. Um, and KPMG's done a great job here. My question is, do we not have project managers? And do they not have MBOs? And, you know, when, when we have the directors and the end of the year comes and, and we're looking at whether management and people who report to management are going to get a raise or, or how they performed. Is this not 
a key part of their performance management objectives. And I, I just don't understand why, you know, some of these things have been on the books for a long time. I don't understand why this isn't a report that gets brought to council quarterly with information on why these projects are still outstanding. Why did we have to go to KPMG to find out about all these projects that are outstanding when um, these things should have been very, very clear, um, at least every single budget for us. And, you know, it, and if that's the case, if KPMG has, uh, has found all this for us, wonderful news, thank you very much. But what are we going to do, and I guess this is a question for the CAO, what are we going to do going forward? to ensure that this is taken care of every single year from this point on. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. I appreciate that question. Um, and, and certainly this is a, a flag for, for staff as well. Um, part of, to catch this on a go forward basis, notwithstanding some of these projects are from 2004, uh, et cetera, but to your question on a go forward basis, uh, a lot of the answer lies in the budget process. And we talked about um, bringing forward projects for your consideration during the budget cycle, which we will realistically initiate uh, either in the calendar year or upwards of 24 months. So part of it's the budget process, part of it is policy perspective. Um, so we have or will have, should have policies in place that are being reviewed to state if a project is not initiated within 24 months of budget approval, then the money automatically goes back uh, into general coffers for reconsideration of utilization of those funds. Um, part of the office of the CAO structure currently is uh, corporate projects policy and liaise. And that corporate projects uh, division will have project managers. Um, in particular, there's a variety of large projects across the corporation where it's not within a single division. In other words, in some cases, a capital project may cross divisions. And so part of it is a, a culture of, of uh, accountability and ownership and empowering a person uh, to be accountable. So when a councillor asks, like yourself, Councillor Bowman, what's the status of this project? You don't get from staff, um, you know, finger pointing, uh, not my, my responsibility, or I thought it was this person or that person. So clarifying roles is critical moving forward, clarifying policies and bringing forward realistic uh, capital budgets with which we will actually implement uh, in, in within 24 months. Thank you, thank you, David. Um, I I agree with that. I agree with that wholeheartedly. Um, however, what my concern is is that every single major project we do, we have a project manager that's handling that project, and the project manager should be very very. Um, it should be very easy for that project manager to tell us exactly what stage of a project we're at, how much money is spent, how much money is uh, is promised on tenders or, or whatever there happens to be, and the percentage of, of probability that this is going to finish on time, that this is going to go over. And, you know, I, I guess, um, you know, as, as a manager, we all manage our assistants. And we sit down with them and we talk about where all these various projects are and how they're going. And we're responsible as, as the leaders to ensure that this stuff gets done. And uh, we've got some great leaders. We've got some great uh, commissioners. And I have all the faith in the world in them. Um, I, I just hope we never have to see uh, an outsourced project like this again to determine why we have projects outstanding. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Bowman. Councillor Santos. Thank you, through you, Chair. Just a question to uh, KPMG very quickly. Um, have we, had, in, in your um, assessment, did you notice any sort of capacity issues? So as we continue to approve capital and budget, have there been capacity issues for us to actually deliver on those timelines and or um, action plans? Um, Councillor Santos, uh, it, at this time in our point of our review, that was not part of our um, 
scope, but part two, uh, I anticipate we will be able to have a better view of that. Okay, great. Just because um, since 2016, we uh, we approved another like few hundred projects and just want to make sure, Bowman, Council Bowman was kind of alluding to it, that we actually have uh, the capacity to deliver on those things. And also, um, as part of your second assessment, it would, I know you're going to bring this forward, it would be great to make sure that we strategically align our priorities when it comes to which capital projects are going to come first, what money, like in terms of cash flow, what we're going to spend on first that will have the biggest impact later on down uh, on the road. Thanks. That's all my questions. Thank you, Councillor Santos. I have no further questions for the delegation, so I have a motion, therefore, moved by Councillor Singh to receive the presentation that the following delegations regarding capital project management assessment checkpoint and path forward to the Committee of Council meeting of June 3rd, 2020 be received. Anyone opposed? Seeing none, that carries. Thank you, KPMG, for all your work and look forward to hearing from you again soon. Thank you. So, members of committee, we are now going to resume the economic development and culture section. We were at the point of asking for councillor question period. I don't think any members of committee have uh, questions. Mr. Clerk, do any members of the public have they sent any questions with regards to the economic development and culture section? Uh, none for this section, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you, Mr. Clerk. So therefore, we'll now move on to the corporate services section, and I'll yield the chair to Councillor Singh. All right, thank you. Moving on to the corporate services uh, section, um, moving on to report uh, 9.2.1, Capital Projects Financial Status Report, Q4 2019. Uh, do any members have any uh, questions related to this report? Seeing none, uh, do any member, oh, Je uh, Councillor Bowman. Thank you, through you, Mr. Chair. Um, the report 9.2.1, um, KPMG did describe some of the reasons why some of these might be outstanding, um, but there are some of them um, that I just don't understand, uh, like, development of a new brand that was that was a, a project from 2017 it was a forty thousand dollar project and to date spending has been zero um, that's on 9.2.1 dash 14 project number 171251 um, so I just don't understand what development of a new brand is Does anybody from staff want to um, answer that? Development of a new brand. Hi, Councillor. It's uh, Jason uh, from Communications um, through the chair. Those funds, I believe, through the this year's budget process, uh, were on the council floor. I believe that the. the uh, request came from Councillor Pileshi, and those funds, I believe, were approved to be. Um, utilized to uh, reduce the, the tax burden and reduce the, the overall budget uh, for this year. Um, the funds originally were for a uh, review of the Flower City brand um, and uh, had been in place for a number of years and unspent and not utilized. And so uh, I believe uh, I, could, I would look for advice from finance on that, but I believe that occurred through this year's budget process. So in other words, the, the funds were canceled. Easy to, easy to say they were just removed or canceled from, so, you know, that's easy to show on a report like this. I'll, I'll go on, I've got, I've got some other questions. Um, uh, item 131443 and 131459, purchasing process automation and mobile corporate printing productivity enhancement both from 2013, a total of 300 and uh, roughly $30,000, of which 170 is still unspent um, seven years later. 
So what type of process automation? I, maybe we should have been looking at automation to speed up the purchasing processes. I don't know. But what type of automation were we looking at there? Thank you, Councillor. I believe uh, Dave Sutton, uh, Treasurer, should be online and be able to respond to that. Uh, through the chair, I uh, everybody hear me? Yep. Yep. Yeah, no, I, I actually don't have the information in front of me um, at the moment. Um, as you can see, there was a budget established and there has been significant spending to date, at least on the uh, purchasing process automation. I would have to look into the uh, remaining funds to see if um, there's if that if there's uh, more work to be done on that uh, project uh, before those funds are returned, um, or if those uh, if that project can now be closed out. Um, I just do want to. Um, make mention that this is as a point in time, I think going back to Jason's comment about um, the branding, um, this is as of December 31st, so so there's ongoing changes that are occurring with these projects, additional spending, uh, procurements that are happening, um, and projects that are being closed out in return of funds. So um, again, this is a snapshot in time, um, and, and there are ongoing changes uh, all the time uh, to, to the project status. Okay. Um there's, a, there's another one right underneath that, Dave, uh, 151341, Talent Management from uh, 2015, and that was uh, six, over 600 grand for that, with 50,000 still outstanding five years later. Um, do we have more talent we need to get? Uh, through the chair, I, um, so uh, again, um, the project may have been in, uh, approved in 2015, um, and, and similarly for other projects, um, however, um, it may take 12 to 24 months before the procurement is out the door, um, so and then and then work begins on those. So so some, in some cases, projects like these uh, and many projects uh, in on our books um, will take a period of time to deliver on them. Um, you know, technology is one of those. If it's technology implementation, for instance, uh, which I believe this talent manage, management one is, um, there uh, would be uh, some some time period um, to a first procure procure the project ensure that we have all the resources in place to to actually deliver on the project and then there would be a time period uh, you know th that it may take one to possibly three years to deliver a project um, so I, I think this is you know when we get back to the work that KPMG is going to do on their phase two um, you know we're hoping that uh, we come back and, and we can provide council with a better understanding of how uh, how we plan and how projects get approved and, and the time span in which um, projects are delivered. Okay, thanks very much, Dave. Just one more. Um, there's actually three energy management projects, um, one from 2017, one from 2018, and one from 2019. And I'm all in favor of the uh, energy management programs and, uh, and uh, the lighting and things like that that we're putting in place. Is there any way on these charts when we have a budget and the spending to date and remaining budget. Is there anywhere on these charts that we might be also able to add a column for what that investment in something like an energy program has actually saved us or given us in a rebate or uh, a come back to us in any way? Uh, through the chair, um, we could certainly do that here. I'm not necessarily certain if this is the appropriate place to do it. It may be something that council wants to report on uh, to come back on on energy initiatives, there, there, not everything is included here uh, within the capital projects. Uh, there may be some operating uh, uh, type of expenditures as well that uh, that will help improve energy efficiency or or go towards those types of things. Uh, and it may be a more comprehensive report we're looking for, uh, manage, some style of management reporting uh, that council is looking for that may be complementary to this type of reporting. Um, and, but that's a consideration we can make uh, as we work with, um, I know uh, in speaking with Janet and her team, um, they do have some ideas around reporting um, and, uh, and improving that aspect of, of uh, the capital project reporting. So it's definitely something we can take back for consideration um, for, for the phase two and any recommendations that uh, KPMG comes out with. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Bowman. Uh, Councillor Pleshi, I'm, uh, I'm trying to read the message. You have something you want to add? 
Uh, very quickly, Mr. Chair, I just wanted to uh, uh, highlight the um, the amount of money that was reduced uh, during the last budget uh, was reflective of the um, rebranding. Um, it was council's decision during that budget to uh, to remove that funding um, to alleviate some of the stresses of uh, for the taxpayers. So I just wanted to highlight that and um, bring attention to it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And, uh, oh, Councillor uh, Vicent. Thank you. Through you, Chair. Um, I just want to thank uh, staff for preparing this report. You know. Uh, I've been watching the City of Brampton for a long time and uh, the question of uh, management of capital projects comes up time and time again and I know that staff have been asked to look at this a, a number of times and uh, what I've learned uh, over the years is that managing capital projects is not easy. Uh, there are so many variables that staff need to juggle on a, on a regular basis. Studies and EAs take a great deal of time and are often subject to changes in scope. So I think that um, in the previous section, uh, both Councillor Bowman and Councillor Santos, I think, spoke to, um, and this may come in a future recommendation from Key PMG, that the City of Brampton just needs to uh, perhaps establish a, a, a system to manage our projects. And it's important that when we make a decision to move forward on a project that the scope remains very tight and that should ensure or help staff in being able to deliver these projects on time within the budget that was approved. Um, one project at our wards, the Williams Parkway uh, widening, has been on the books for a great deal of time and it's taken a great deal of time because of a number of different factors, including us today uh, asking staff to review it. So those are my comments and I just want to just thank staff for all the work that they do to continue to um, prepare this information as they always do on a regular basis because it's, it's, it's us being transparent, it's them reporting to the residents what is happening with our, our, the money that we are spending on their behalf. So thank you. Thank you, Councillor Vicent. Uh, I have a motion by Councillor Vicent to approve the report recommendations. Is there anyone opposed to this motion? Otherwise your vote will count in the affirmative. Seeing none, thank you. There are no objections, so the motion uh, carries. 9.2.2 was considered part of the consent. Uh, moving on to 9.3.1 was a discussion at the request of uh, Councillor Medeiros on service delivery. Thank you, uh, Chair Singh. Um, uh, members of Council, I, I brought this forward at the time, just before the pandemic. Um, I was going to raise it, but I think uh, uh, as the pandemic has come and we're looking at ways um, not only to promote social distancing but ensure uh, service delivery. Um, you know, in, in conversations with our CAO who's been, uh, uh, you know, excellent in, in providing guidance and in terms of how we can uh, bring someone forward. Uh, essentially, I've put a motion uh, um, which looks, uh, uh, which directs staff to uh, come back with a strategy in terms of providing uh, uh, seamless service delivery. So essentially, what, what does that mean? Or uh, no wrong door approach. There's different different technical aspects, but it's the ability that our residents can go into, uh, for example, a rec center, and similar to a Service Ontario or Service Canada, sort of have all the suite of services there instead of having to go to in person to a certain department. Um, I myself experienced this over last summer where I had to go to several different departments uh, to get different, uh, uh, be it a, a drawing, be it access uh, some other uh, uh, documents. Uh, so what I've essentially have asked is, uh, what, what essentially the, the motion states is that we have uh, staff come back to us and develop a strategy uh, and to sort of develop that sort of service Brampton, uh, service Brampton concept uh, where uh, this way we won't have everyone going to, for example, the building department to, to pick up a permit. They'll be able to, if it's uh, available online and then we have technology in place, uh, that simply they can go to their closest uh, uh, sort of uh, their closest uh, facility uh, uh, in the city of Brampton, uh, be it a rec center or whatever we deem, um, and they can access you know the suite of services, pay their property tax or or do whatever. Uh, so I've just essentially asked staff to look into this and come back uh, with uh, sort of a strategy on how we can do that. 
All right, thank you. Uh, do any members have any uh, questions regarding the motion? I'll give everybody uh, 30 seconds to read that they're for us in particular. Maybe I'll start with uh, the questions I'm seeing that. Um, my question is to uh, CAO Barrick. Um, are we doing anything regarding our service delivery from uh, the KPMG service review that's happening? So thank you, Councillor. If I understand your question correctly, the, uh, you're not talking about the KPMG report at today's meeting, but rather- No, no, no. The service review, yeah the audit that's happening. I thought they were going to come back with recommendations. Uh, I don't know how in deep they were going to get in our service delivery, but I thought maybe that work was already happening of how we can have better uh, customer service. Uh, so I, I know much of that review was done uh, finalized in January. And, okay. uh, and the city's taking some, some action uh, with respect to those other service reviews. They were kind of there were several of them, and KPMG's role yeah. was to review them all in a consistent way. Um, yeah. And so the city's taken some action on, on that already. I would okay. say from a staff perspective, we would welcome this motion here. Um, okay. We're already uh, looking at ways to accommodate, uh, as Councilor Medeiros uh, noted, in terms of working with our IT staff and recreational staff to do a pilot in a couple of our community centers. Okay. And uh, depending on the, that approach, rolling it out uh, across the corporation. So this resolution will be very helpful for us in um, uh, having council support to do that. Okay, thank you. I don't see any other uh, questions. Uh, so we have the motion in front of us by Councillor Medeiros. Is there anyone opposed to this mo motion? Otherwise, your vote will count in the affirmative. Seeing none, thank you. There are no objections, so the motion carries. Uh, moving on to 9.3.2 is a discussion at the request of um, Councillor Fertini on um, bylaw and uh, cameras. Body camera. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I did send the motion over to Pierre. Uh, Mr. Chair and Councillor Fortini will bring them up that motion up momentarily. It's on the screen now. Yeah, and, uh, you know, as we look at the bylaws, and we just had an incident not too long ago with our bylaws, and and it's a good uh, thing. So when uh, they're on scene, everything's recorded, uh, and it would be good, you know, for uh, the safety of them, just like our appeal police, and that everything's there, and they could do our job with a lot better, and also with the safety vests. And I know as other municipalities do wear safety vests, and we don't have any. So I put the motion forward and thank you to Councillor Bowman for uh, seconding it. All right, thank you. Uh, Councillor Williams has a question. Yes, thank you. Um, it's more of a, a, a friendly amendment. I wonder if we can include um, security um, in this as well, not just bylaws. Uh, security often are responding to um, situations around our city and um, are can be at times placed in um, um, dangerous situations and um, it would really help with um, their ability to um, interact with residents safely and also um, it, it is really great for that um, accountability piece and, and so on and so forth. So I'm just wondering if the mover of the motion would be um, happy to add um, security as well. Uh, I have no problem with that. I think some of the security are wearing vests, but I think they're private. Uh, we have nothing to do with it. Uh, so we have to ask staff if it's okay, but I think it's a private company. And I know that say, sorry, and I know that to say that a lot of them are wearing vests and it's not provided through the private security. Uh, thank you. I, I was uh, making that comment in reference to um, the cameras to the cameras not not specifically the vests uh, more for the cameras well again I have no problem but it's a private uh, I don't know if we could ask we could ask staff if it's possible if we could do it but I think it's a private 
So we have to go through the private company that has a contract. Uh, through the chair, also. this is this is Jasbir here. Yeah. Uh, I just want to say that we have a hybrid model, and uh, currently we do have about four uh, officers, uh, which we call them the the security guard, but they are the full time staff, and they 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 go on the more critical missions than the private security. So we we have a blend, and our intention is to grow more. So we will go and explore that whole, if, if the council direction is to uh, put on the cameras, then we will uh, look into the options for our in-house uh, uniform security guards, as well as the how to route it through the private security to the, yeah. with the vendor. Yeah. And I'm okay with that. I didn't know we had so. So if we have them at their ours, yes, uh, absolutely. That would be a great idea. Thank you, Councilor Charmaine Williams. Thank you. So it seems uh, just to clarify, Councilor Fergini, you accept that friendly then? Yes, I do. Okay, perfect. Uh, Councillor Vicente? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just want to just provide a brief comment, uh, perhaps that may or may not uh, help staff uh, with respect to coming back. Uh, I think in, in this situation where we are looking at the possibility that uh, a bylaw officer or a security official may encounter resistance or the possibility of threats, um, I think even in policing, uh, police uh, often and security officials, uh, staff, uh, do a threat assessment uh, before uh, doing work in a particular area or, for example, responding to a call. So I I'd like to see um, whether or not staff would like to see flexibility in this, in that it is not mandatory across the board, but uh, utilized where uh, the member of staff, uh, the officer, uh, deems that it is necessary for them to do their work in the area that they are about to be working in. That's uh, my comment. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Thank Did you for your... that uh, through Mr. Chair? Yes, you may. Yeah, so I think by law, the way it works is a dispatch, and they end up going to certain areas and when they're called, you don't do a reassessment first. So you dispatch and away you go. So we got to look at the, at the whole around the corporation, the city of Brampton, where they're going. It's not that they're actually doing a reassessment before they're dispatching going. And especially with the social distancing, they're, they're all over the place now with these parties and parks. And, and they're going with pairs, or sometimes there's three of them. So, you know, uh, it's hard to pinpoint. Point to, so... Uh, I, I like the idea, but it's very hard. So I don't know if staff can actually pinpoint, say, okay, before you go, let's do a reassessment. That's the same thing as Peel Police. When they're called, they just go. Uh, we don't do a reassessment and say, I wonder if I should go to this certain place before we go. That's, a, that's just my thought. Okay, fair enough. Um, so we have the motion in front of us. And... Uh, is there anybody else who would like to speak before I call the vote? Seeing none, I just want to make a comment that uh, thank you for bringing this motion, uh, Councillor Fertini, Councillor Bowman, and your amendment, Councillor Williams. Uh, I wholeheartedly support this. Uh, I have a motion from Councillor Fertini to um, uh, for the for the uh, motion. Uh, are any members opposed to this motion? Otherwise, your vote will count in the affirmative. Thank you. There are no objections, uh, so the motion uh, carries. Uh, moving on, um, we have counselors' question period. Do any counselors have any questions? Seeing none, moving on to the public question period. Do any um, do any members have any questions from the public? Um, Through you, Mr. Chair. Yes, there are two questions that have come in. The first is from Sylvia Menezes Roberts. And this is in regard to the capital project um, status report. Um, with the money that is left over in the Acceleride Zoom project, which is shown on page 9.2.1-12 of the report, and that it was originally planned for completion in 2021, does this mean that the project has accomplished both its um, being both below budget and ahead of schedule? That is the question. Okay, could you just repeat that one more time for staff and then they can... Certainly, answer. with the money that is left over in the Acceleride Zoom project and that it was originally planned for completion in 2021, does this mean the project has, accompl 
has been accomplished, being both below budget and ahead of schedule. Do any members of staff um, can they answer that question? Certainly, uh, through you, Chair Singh. Um, yeah, I believe that's the wonder. I'm just trying to quickly refer to here whether it's the airport road or the Zoom phase two. Mm -hmm. um, and that's on, okay, the page, yeah, so the page that's referring to that one there is, is in fact uh, a project that was delivered in the Accelerate phase two program that is, uh, is under budget uh, and ahead of schedule. Uh, so that is an accurate um, um, summary of what the delegate uh, has, has pointed out. Thank you. Um, that's good news. <laughs> uh, next uh, question uh, to the clerk. Uh, yes. So the next question is from Wesley Jackson, uh, Brampton resident, regarding the KPMG review. Uh, whether or not the KPMG review identified any current expense projects being funded out of capital budgets or otherwise identified any irreg irregular funds being transferred into the capital budget from other than property taxes or development charges i.e. from the general rate stabilization fund or other revenue or other reserves intended for that purpose. I'll repeat okay. the question. Yeah, thank you. Whether or not the KPMG review identified any current expense projects, in quotes, being funded out of the capital budget, in quotes, or otherwise identified any irregular funds being transferred into the capital budget from other than property taxes or development charges, i.e. from the general rate stabilization fund or other reserves intended for other purposes. Thank you. Um, I think the treasurer would be in the best situation to answer that. Uh, through the chair, um, I, I, KPMG through this current review uh, would not have looked at that uh, as part of their, their review. Um, however, I should point out that um, in our uh, annual audit, um, KPMG um, through the through the other um, uh, KPMG partners uh, would uh, actually be looking at the appropriate uh, uh, funding of, of capital projects and so on. Um, I will keep in mind that um, yes, we do have in some cases where um, projects are funded from general rate stabilis general rate stabilization reserve, um, but those are all uh, approved by council. Um, uh, through either the budget process or through um, uh, reports that come forward throughout the year uh, on, on special uh, project initiatives. So there are some cases uh, where uh, funds are tapped into, uh, reserves are, are, are accessed uh, for projects um, that are not um, necessarily our, our repair and replacement reserve or development charge reserves um, and other uh, federal gas tax reserves. And those tend to be very small projects, if I'm not mistaken, correct? That is correct. They tend to be uh, smaller in nature, uh, not large scale. We do, we obviously try to ensure that we, we maintain that general rate stabilization yeah. reserve uh, for its intended purpose. Thank you. Okay. Um, it, it, does that um, complete all the questions? For this section, Mr. Chair, yes. Okay. Thank you so much uh, to the clerk. Um, that is the end of the corporate services section. Um, now I will pass it on to Chair Vicent for the public works and engineering section. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now move to item 10.2.1, a staff report on the new transit facility update. Do any members have questions or comments regarding the staff report item 10.2.1? Councilor uh, Mayor Brown, please proceed. Uh, thank you. So um, this is about the new transit facility. Um, it, Alex, uh, I, I thought we won't get into getting to this until 11, but but we're doing we're dealing with this now, I guess. Uh, yeah, through through um, through the chair to Mayor Brown. Uh, yes, if we can, if I could just touch on the report uh, quickly, I think it would be helpful. Uh, it does fall under public works. My uh, my, my colleague, uh, Commissioner Reyna, uh, looks after the BDC, the building design and construction folks, and, and this um, project falls under that area. Uh, this is strictly a report that comes back. There was a request made some time ago about an opportunity to electrify that facility given some of the federal ministerial mandate for electric vehicles. Uh, so this report touches on uh, the estimated, high-level estimated costs on what it would be to electrify uh, that third facility. And that's the intent of the report, okay. uh, as we outlined. 
Okay, good. Uh, well, Alex, uh, I've talked about this before. I've spoken to Minister McKenna about this. Uh, she seemed to be pretty excited about what we were talking about in, in Brampton, but at some point, Council needs to commit to this uh, as well. Now, obviously, this transit facility is not going to be possible unless we get um, federal and provincial funding, and it, it, this is an eligible area that we expect to get to get funding. Um, but I have to say, cities that have pre-existing transit systems, they cannot adapt as easily as transit systems that are growing. Um, this this needs to be part of our federal and provincial ask. Uh, we talk an ambitious. Uh, uh, game on climate change. Well, these are the decision points. These are the decision points. If you're building a transit facility now, the costs are extremely high, significantly higher down the road you have to retrofit it. Um, it's decisions like this where we have to say we're committed to our climate change goals. We're going to run a green transit system. One of the reasons the federal government did the pilot project in Brampton last summer is they believe that we're in a position where we can adapt if, if it works. And so um, I hope that we can um, uh, send a clear signal that we um, that we want this third transit facility to be electrified, that this is part of our of our ask. Um, and this could be a shining example in, in, in Canada. And frankly, other municipalities will be envious. You know, you look at Toronto or Montreal or Vancouver that have pre-existing um, pre transit um, systems, they couldn't do this. This is a golden opportunity. I realize it's a significant cost, but we're going to get funding from the provincial and federal governments through it. Um, and frankly, I think they're going to be excited about it. You know, just I was going through all our different transit needs with, with Minister McKenna. As soon as we got to this one, the, the fact we were looking at at uh, the cost of electrification, she got excited about it. You know, very rarely do you get that type of enthusiasm when you're talking to a, um, a funding partner. So um, I know we've all talked about this before, but I think this motion um, that we put forward and the clerk and Alex uh, Maholajic has, has helped me draft um, would put a clear indication that council is committed to this. Councillor Vasante? Um, we, we have, so we have a motion? Uh, yes, it is. The, it should be on the screen. It, through you, Mr. Chair, it is on the screen. And I believe Councillor Singh would like to second it. Taken as read. <laughs> okay, so we have a question from Councillor Santos. No, I, I don't have a. I don't have a question. I believe Councillor Singh has a question, and he's seconding the motion. Councillor Singh. Yeah, just briefly, I uh, just want to make sure and, and just hear from um, uh, Alex that w this won't delay the project, correct? Uh, through the chair of Vicente, no, uh, Councillor Singh, it will definitely not delay the project. And uh, as the mayor mentioned already. Uh, it's a prime opportunity because the challenge for many systems are the infrastructure and the state of readiness for the infrastructure. It's a prime opportunity to uh, build a strip facility. Given uh, where we're at now with the A phase, it, it's a perfect timing and absolutely shouldn't delay this at all um, if we uh, get this rolling. Sure, and I'd like to just, uh, if the mayor doesn't mind, add a friendly that we also send it to the five Brampton MPs because, um, as you recall, one uh, um, MP Sidhu also visited the site and and we talked extensively about uh, um, the transit facility. So I believe it'd be good if they get a copy of this motion as well. Thank you, Councillor. And you're asking for a recorded vote, seeing no further questions. Yeah, just uh, it's MPs, not MPPs. Thank you, Councillor. So we have a recorded vote. One sort of one final clarification. So just to Alex, um, if we're successful in this, obviously the capital budget is going to need to be amended. And so um, would there be some subsequent report that would come back to us that would enable for us to do that? Uh, yes, uh, through the chair, Mayor Brown, 
uh, clearly we'd, we'd uh, staff would report back because right now uh, our ask uh, through the ICIP funding to build a facility without the electrification uh, requires 175 million and that's uh, the, the first phase of this construction to house uh, 250 vehicles much like we did with the Sandalwood facility then down the road we could expand it out to our full growth for 440 vehicles um, so absolutely we would report back for the capital budget uh, in the event uh, the electrification of what we're building now would come back to us we would report back with all the budget uh, budgetary capital budget implications okay great thank you Mr. Clerk, uh, are we proceeding with the vote then for item 10.2.1? Through you, Mr. Chair, yes. We, I think first we should take the motion um, to just receive the report and receive the, the associated correspondence, which Charlotte is on the previous page, and then we can take uh, the mayor's motion on the electrification after that with a recorded vote on the second part, unless committee requests a recorded vote on the first part as well. Okay, thank you. So members of committee, uh, we have a motion moved by Councillor Bowman to receive the report and the correspondence that the report titled New Transit Facility to the Committee of Council meeting of June 3rd, 2020 be received and that the correspondence from Sylvia Menezes Roberts, Brampton residence, dated June 22nd, June 20, uh, 2020 on item 10.2.1 for the New Transit Facility update be received. Is there anyone opposed? Seeing none, the motion carries. And so now we have a motion moved by Mayor Brown. And through you, Mr. Chair, a recorded vote's been requested on the mayor's motion. Councillor Santos? Um, yes. Seconded by Councillor Singh, and my vote is yes. Councillor Visa uh, Chair Visante? Yes. Councillor Willens? Yes. Councillor Pileschi? I support the motion. Councillor Bowman? Yes. Councillor Medeiros? Yes. Councillor Williams? Yes. Councillor Fortini? Councillor Fortini? I'll come back to you. Councillor Singh? Yes. Councillor Dillon? Support. Mayor Brown? Mayor Brown. In, in favor and, and to the clerk, can we have all of council second the motion? Through, through you uh, to the chair, we, we can put that notation in, in the minutes, yes. Um, so uh, Mayor Brown has voted yes. Councilor Fortini, are you there? Do you vote in favor? Councilor Fortini? Uh, Mr. Chair, Councillor Fortini is on the call, but uh, his mic is not active, and uh, we will come back to him. But at the moment, the, the motion carries uh, 10 to 0 with one potential absence. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. Items 10.2 through 10.2.4 were in the consent agenda. There's no new business, so we move on to Councillor Question Period. Do any members of Council have a question with any item in this section of the agenda? Seeing none, public question period. Mr. Clerk, have we received any correspondence from members of the public with regards to items of the, in this part of Committee of Council agenda? No, nothing for this section, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. So we'll now move on to Section 11, Community Services, to be chaired by Councillor Santos. Councillor Santos. Thank you, Councillor Vicente. We are now in the Community Services section of the Committee agenda. Um, 11.2 under reports. I know that uh, General Manager Alex Milojevic would like to just give a brief overview um, about the next two reports, 11.2.1 and 11.2.2. So, um, General Manager Milojevic, please go ahead. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Santos. And, and um, the Brampton Transit Recovery Plan. Uh, I'll just give a brief overview. As you know, we've undertaken uh, many measures through the COVID period in terms of protecting not only our employees, but um, our customers as well. And it's been an ever-changing uh, environment from day one with the changes with the provincial, federal, uh, regional governments, and of course, our municipal government as well. In saying that, this report highlights some areas um, that we're trying to get to in terms of recovery plan. 
uh, some of the stuff uh, that, that I'll try to cover is to explain a little bit of the report that, that may help with some of the questions that I think may arise from this report. One of the ones uh, that are being recommended here is moving back to front door boardings and by uh, going to front door boardings uh, we, we can start collecting fares as well. In doing that we can also gain a more seating capacity between three to five more seats and currently today on a 40-foot bus because we're trying to respect some physical distancing we have adjacent seats uh, signed off and uh, right now we're running approximately 15 uh, people as a maximum per bus and we stop picking up after that. With the provincial openings of, of uh, slowly opening up the economy, we're experiencing heavier ridership than uh, we have in, in the past month or so. And we're starting to find that a lot of our buses are running over capacity. We're only carrying still 15 people, but we're plugging in more services to uh, pick up the slack, so to speak. But again, we're expecting that uh, our ridership is going to get to a point where we won't be able to carry uh, due to our physical uh, distancing limitations that we currently have in our, in our buses. So by introducing front door boardings, by introducing the fare collection, we're also recommending in this report that we uh, defer the 2020 fare increase that we proposed during the 2020 budget process to a point in time where uh, Council can give us that direction uh, once we um, do a post-COVID uh, part where we can start going to a normal operating environment. Uh, the other part too where we're asking to defer and recommending in this report and that's the bylaw amendments that you're seeing in the recommendations, is the deferral of the free seniors fare as well. And uh, primarily what we're doing with that is um, because of senior fares, we require seniors uh, to come in uh, to get the, um, uh, the identification done and the processing and everything. We don't feel it's an appropriate time to be doing that uh, given the COVID conditions. So, so that's some of the recommendations that we're making in here as well. One of the other parts that, that we're doing as well uh, and I'm going to speak a little bit about the masks that uh, the mayor talked about at the press conference this morning and any amendments. We have the measures listed on um, the 10 measures listed on one of the pages in the report. And I just want to touch, I think it's important to touch on a few of these. Uh, the physical barriers, many of our, our, our transit uh, people across Ontario and Canada are, are going through the same recovery plan. The issue is around barriers. Ottawa is putting up a temporary film. Uh, to, to do that barrier, then they're implementing what, uh, what Brampton currently has today, a hard surface barrier, a plexiglass type barrier that we uh, installed about a year and a half ago with council uh, endorsement and approval. So we have that in place. <clears throat> we are sanitizing our vehicles uh, every 24 hours. We're also going to be encouraging that our customers um, carry their own uh, hand sanitizers. And also, given the FAIR implementation, the recovery of FAIR, we're promoting strongly the use of Presto because uh, that's a contact system, so there, there's less contact points with customers um, returning to a, a FAIR payment system. I'm going to get into a bit of the campaign. Um, we're working closely with uh, Stratcom, Jason's group, in terms of the communication campaign. We, and I'm going to look to our, our city clerk, Mr. Fay, in regards to uh, if there's any changes that we have to do in this report um, and have council endor or committee endorse this now. With the announcement of the mandatory masks this morning, um, we believe that it will strengthen the position of reducing the risk on our, on our vehicles to our customers and our, uh, and our staff. However, the report, the way it reads right now, talks about strongly recommending the use of masks when the report was written. Um, that's what we were doing at the time. So if there's an amendment to be had, I think it would be a good opportunity um, to, to put that in. The last part, if I could just add, the transit service centers that we currently have closed, and that's our uh, staff to sell fare media at our terminals, will be reopening uh, before the July 2nd proposed recovery date. That will allow people to start closing fare payment or fare um, value on their Presto cards, and that will probably happen in, in the middle of June. Uh, so I'll stop there, uh, Chair Santos, and if there's any questions that anybody might have, um, I'll try to answer them. Thank you uh, very much, Alex. There is uh, one question on 11.2.1 from Councillor Williams. Councillor Williams, go ahead. 
Hi, thank you. Um, to the chair, um, Alex, thanks for bringing this report forward. I think everyone is pretty eager to um, get back out there and feel confident to take our transit. Um, so, you know, I know we've spoken about um, transit and the safety of our riders, and I think transit has done an excellent job at um, running different campaigns to encourage um, proper hand washing and um, to support the social distancing on the buses. Um, so many of the community have said, though, that they don't don't feel comfortable taking transit because um, they see many people not wearing masks and um, people have expressed that they feel that taking transit isn't an option anymore because of, of not feeling very safe. You know, when you look at some of the reasons why people aren't wearing masks, um, you know, we've heard that it, it can, it's claustrophobic, you know, they are also hard to get, um, they're expensive in some stores and um, so, it, sorry? Um, and so, oh, you know, sorry. the questions around, um, you know, encouraging to wear masks, and I really like that we're going to make that amendment to the recommendations. Um, we want to make sure that our, our riders are feeling safe. Um, so I do have a motion to put on the floor, um, and it's, um, it's around providing masks um, for our riders to help them feel confident while taking our buses. And um, I'm not sure if it's on the screen, if Peter Faye could bring it up, please. Um, through, through you, Madam I'll just Chair. Re Sorry. Yes? Sorry, I don't recall a motion being received oh, by your office you for this item. Yeah, oh, I, we emailed it earlier today. But we can, I can email it again. That's no problem. Um, Councillor Williams, just to be clear, is this an amendment to the current motion or is this a completely different motion that you're adding? It's, it, it could be as an amendment, but it, I could move it afterwards. It's um, for staff to report on the cost and feasibility of providing um, free branded masks for distribution to our riders and um, to bring that back to us to Council. Okay, so I would, it would be great uh, if uh, General Manager Milojevic, if you could please provide some comment uh, in terms of the costs associated with providing masks for all transit riders. Absolutely, um, through you, Chair Santos. You know, my suggestion would be strongly, I mean, you, you brought up uh, some of the stuff that came up with the um, uncomfortableness of, of people riding transit. I mean, Abacus did a survey um, that that we clearly indicate where 24% of the people that were surveyed uh, are really reluctant to look at um, using transit until a post vaccine. There are 69% who would ride under conditions, and one of them are around cleanliness, uh, reducing the amount of people instead of full standing loads. Um, what I would strongly suggest: there are huge cost implications of of, of providing um, non medical masks to um, to the entire uh, customers, what what we could look at, if, if this is the, the council direction, is to look at a campaign where we may be able to provide a limited amount of masks. Again, it's going to be around sourcing it out. It'll be around um, what quantity would be reasonable, much like Ottawa is doing. They're doing a very limited. Uh, so, you know, my suggestion would be that if there was an appetite to look at providing some masks, that we look at a limited quantity. In, in, during a campaign, because the masks are non-medical masks and even a facial covering. So when you look at scarves, when you look at different type of um, materials that you can use, it doesn't necessarily have to be uh, a mask that we provide. So I, I would clearly suggest that if, it, if it's appetite of council and, and Councillor Williams as well, that uh, we look at maybe a limited campaign that we can look at and get the costing on that and then um, we could bring that back to council and get a direction to go ahead if it's under a certain uh, amount. Um, yes, absolutely. Thank you, through the chair. It 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 would be um, not uh, not for all riders. It would be more of a a certain amount. And um, just looking at the cost, just a report back, um, sharing what those costs would be, and um, how we'd be able to get uh, some of these branded masks that say Brampton Transit on them, um, whether it is um, there for all of our, especially our operators, to have a Brampton Transit mask that um, they can wear and um, a, a certain quantity for um, our riders, just to encourage um, and, and drive home the message that we, we take their, their safety seriously. Um, I see that Peter, um, Mr. Faye does have the motion now. 
And um, through, through you, um, Madam Chair, yes, my apologies. I didn't see your email that came in just before the meeting started. So I believe it is on the screen now. I believe you can see it. Okay. Thank you. So I do have uh, a couple of questions from other councillors. Um, I think we have to deal with the first uh, motion that was on the screen first. Is that correct, Mr. Clerk? The motion just to uh, the staff recommendations? Yeah, the staff recommendations and the report, and then we could deal with Councillor Williams after. Uh, yes, because I don't see them as contrary. Okay, sounds good. So, Councillor Pileshi, um, uh, Councillor Pileshi, Councillor Pileshi, you had a question, followed by Councillor Bowman. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so I just wanted to highlight that this is uh, something that's separate. I'm happy to, um, I'd like for us to go ahead and move the Brampton Transit Recovery Plan um, and then open up the agenda to add Councillor Williams' um, motion that she's put forward. But I also request that um, I didn't get a good look at the motion um, she had put forward, but I'm uh, asking that staff uh, consider the opportunities for um, for outsourcing the the branding of those masks. Uh, I'm not sure. I, I really need to know a cost of um, providing masks to all of our ridership. I don't think that it is um, very feasible. So I'd like to understand if there's opportunities out there currently for branding of the masks to alleviate some of the costs that um, um, the city would have to bear. Um, I'd like that opportunity and if we could uh, refer that back to staff to come back with um, with that opportunity and I, I think I see that in the therefore be it resolved that staff um, report on the cost and feasibility so I'm, I'm supportive of that and um, but I would like to in procedurally um, this I feel that this is separate from uh, the agenda so I'd like to go ahead and move uh, the motion take the vote on the on the transit motion and then also reopen the agenda to add this thank you madam chair uh, I refer back to the clerk mr. clerk you had mentioned that this is this particular motion is related to the report is it necessary for us to reopen the agenda through you madam chair my advice is no um, the transit recovery report does address the issue of masks and this is an issue with regards to the use of masks by transit riders. So I think it, it aligns with the item um, that is currently before committee. Okay, thank you, Mr. Clerk. Um, Councillor Bowman, you had another question followed by um, uh, General Manager Veloyevic. Thank you, through you, Madam Chair. Very quickly, um, the, the question is actually for Alex, if they've noticed um, uh, a a dramatic increase in the number of riders wearing masks. Um, we did a, I guess uh, Jason's on there too, we did a transit mask campaign on South Asian radio, I guess last week, we had uh, seven radio stations listed. So I'm just wondering if that uh, had any impact or if we had any way to measure that. So if I can through Chair uh, Santos, we haven't uh, had a real good way of measuring it. I know at uh, one of the previous meetings, I was asked you know, what percentage of our customers are, are uh, that are riding our system uh, use masks. I think I believe I quote around 40 to 50 percent. We did do a scan by our on-street supervision, and we noted to be around a 25 to 30 percent, so lower than I th expected it would be or what I thought it would be. Um, clearly, we don't have an indication of that campaign what uh, impact it had. What I would just ask if I can if I can make note. Um, the intent of the motion, and I think it's great that that you know we're trying to get something done. But I would ask council to consider, or committee to consider, we have a very limited or short runway to do all this, especially with the campaign where we have to work with our Stratcom folks. Uh, I believe that um, in order for us to get a lot of this effort, we need to have a decision here fairly quickly, and especially if we're ordering some campaign masks. I would use caution. On the logo side, I think it's great to have a logo, but this stuff will take time uh, and may take more money. We may we may not have to report back to council if, if committee just gives us the direction to look at a campaign using some limited distribution or limited um, outreach for masks through through the current uh, decision making process that we have without coming back to council. 
So I strongly recommend if committee could consider that because it will allow us to continue on with our plans uh, in doing every uh, best level of effort to, to execute this in a timely fashion uh, to be prepared for that recovery of July uh, 2nd. Thank you for that feedback. Councillor Bowman, do you have any uh, further questions for Alex? No, I just no, wondered if, if, Jason, if Jason is there, if he maybe has any indication of any um, positive uh, actions that came out from the radio advertising or not? Because obviously, Alex, I mean, Alex, uh, we haven't no we haven't noticed it on the buses yet, but uh, that doesn't that doesn't mean that we didn't get any positive reaction from it. You know, through the chair, and I'm not trying to jump Jason here. Certainly, he could provide more information on that. Any campaign, any radio ad, uh, anything that we can do to encourage the use of masks or uh, um, non medical masks in our system is a positive thing. It, it will always it will always reach out to some of our users, and uh, I think we would see a difference. So that would be helpful, no matter what the case. Thank you Thanks. very much. Councillor Bowman, anything further? No, I'm good. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, I, I just wanted to say, Alex, about the, the branding issue. I, I, I think that, uh, you know, the, the health and safety and public safety issue is far more important uh, than the branding. So I would support um, moving forward as quickly as possible if, uh, if we were to pass this particular motion. Councillor Williams. Uh, thank you, the chair. Just for clarification from Alex, um, are are you saying that the timeline for June 10th is too soon, or would you like it an open timeline? What um, through the chair um, timeline in terms of reporting back? Um, we're hoping not to report back, to be honest with you. But if that's the if that's the desire of committee, of course we'll do that. Uh, what we can do is proceed forward if, if a motion reads something to the fact that we look at providing a campaign to distribute masks in a limited quantity. Um, that's something that we can move forward with with that direction from committee and we can provide uh, the best amount of quantity based on um, funds that we have right now under the COVID conditions through our CAO and through the emergency um, measures office that we can go ahead anyway. Uh, I think if we start looking at getting other more customized logos and everything. I, I believe the cost will be more. Um, just as a, a, a typical practical transit uh, GM, uh, we'd rather put those towards more masks if we can get, uh, maybe non-logoed, but uh, clearly we'd like to come out of this where, where we can say we can move ahead with a campaign, get some uh, masks going uh, and have a motion to give us that ability to do. Absolutely, um, thank you through the chair. I do think uh, I, flexibility uh, is, you know, needed, and I think I, I do think you guys are going to do a great job with any kind of campaign that you put forward. Um, just to address the issue um, that Councillor Pelleshi brought forward about wanting to know the costs and what the impacts are, um, having something come back just to kind of outline that may, um, it, you know, may address some of the con concerns and questions. Um, even if it's a limited quantity, if that limited quantity, if we had a number around that, um, it would be very helpful. Um, it, you know. I, I think that um, maybe having, you, you did mention July 1st is, is going to be um, a, a, a goal date for you for you all. So um, I guess anything coming back, just to outline what you have been able to bring back um, before July 1st would be helpful. And, um, you know, bringing, bringing something back to council that can help kind of guide this decision um, for the branded portion um, and any kind of mass, if we if you are looking at doing free masks um, that aren't branded, we definitely want to provide um, those as soon as possible as well. Um, I, I, I believe it was mentioned that um, in our conversation that Ottawa was doing this as well. Um, do you have the numbers around how much mask Ottawa was, was looking into providing for their riders? Absolutely, through um, through the chair. So Ottawa's purchased approximately 200,000 masks. They have an LRT. They have very heavy ridership along some of their corridors. Um, to your point, that we're we're planning on going front door boarding and fare recovery and implementing the mandatory mask uh, use as of July 2nd after Canada Day. We're trying to align the the fare payment system with our some of our colleagues, some of our other neighboring properties in in the GTHA. The issue becomes that. For us to order the masks now, 
uh, would take a lead time of one or two weeks, and we'd have to work with our measures office to get that done. Then secondary to that, we'd like to start um, campaigning and distributing that prior, a week or two prior to July 2nd. This is where it becomes critical, where we can start getting the masks out there earlier. By July 2nd, have everybody uh, as much as we can on board. So the lead times, we can definitely report back. I'm not trying to resist that, uh, um, Councillor Williams. We can report back on what we've done, if that's a desire of committee, uh, and also some options for future ones and logos. But for us to get out there ahead of the curve, we'd have to do that uh, sooner than later. Okay, great. Well, I think the ver therefore be it resolved as it is um, with, with an open timeline for any kind of a report back if you want to just update us on what you've been doing, um, I think is fine. I do, um, yeah, I, I, I'm happy to uh, move the motion as it is right now and uh, we can move on. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, I look to the clerk. I do believe we have to move to receive the first report and the correspondence from Sylvia Roberts. Is that correct for 11.2.1? Uh, through you, Madam Chair, would be to approve the staff recommendations in the first report and receive the correspondence from um, Sylvia and the additional person who provided correspondence that was distributed to members prior to the meeting. Okay, perfect. Um, so therefore, uh, that the report titled Brampton Transit Recovery Plan to the Committee of Council meeting of June 3rd, 2020 be received and that Council enact the bylaw attached as Appendix 1 to amend bylaw 52-2020 attached as Appendix 2 in that the collection of Brampton Transit fees under Schedule G for user fee bylaw 380-2003 is amended be suspended until fair collection is restarted on July 2nd, 2020. That Council defer the 2020 fare increase by enacting the bylaw attached as Appendix 1 in, this, in that Schedule D of user fee bylaw 380 2003 is amended, be further amended by deleting the reference to August 31st, 2020 under the fares column and replacing it with the words a date to be set by council. And number four, that council endorse the deferral of the fall implementation of the free fares for Brampton seniors residents to date to a date in 2021 to be proposed in a future report to council as part of the 2021 budget process and to extend the validity period of the current Brampton Transit senior ID cards. Uh, to avoid requiring seniors to come in person to Brampton Transit facilities to acquire a senior ID card. And number five, that the correspondence from Sylvia Menezes Roberts, Brampton resident, dated June 20, June 2nd, 2020, um, re regarding the report item 11.2.1 Brampton Transit Recovery Plan be received as well as the additional uh, correspondence from Mark uh, Sibamale, Brampton resident. Okay, do any members have any objections to this motion? If not, your vote will count in the affirmative. I see no objectives. Let's move on to Councillor Wu. Yeah, Alex, go ahead. My apologies to interject like that. Uh, just for uh, Mr. Fay, in terms of capturing the mandatory masks, his report doesn't reflect that. I, I would look for some guidance uh, on how that can be captured in here. So th through you, Madam Chair, um, if a member would wish to move an, an amendment to that, uh, those staff recommendations to make the mandatory mask wearing policy in effect, it could be a, an amendment to say that uh, an additional clause be added that the Brampton Transit implement a mandatory mask wearing policy for all riders entering Brampton Transit buses effective, I'm presuming it would be July 1st or 2nd, and an appropriate public awareness campaign be activated as soon as possible, if that's the intent. Okay, and I see Councillor Williams uh, wanting to move amendment number five. And that is for July the 2nd. Okay, the motion is before Council. Do any members oppose? If not, your vote will be counted in the affirmative. I see no opposition. That motion carries. The next motion we will deal with is moved by Councillor Williams. Do any members have any further questions or comments related to this motion? I see nothing. Okay, anyone opposed to this motion? If there's no opposition, your vote will be counted in the affirmative. I see no opposition. The motion is carried. 
The next item of the agenda is 11.2.2, a staff report regarding the LRT extension study along Main Street from Brampton Gateway Terminal to Brampton GO Station, and a short list of LRT alignments in Wards 1, 3, and 4. And uh, General Manager Maloyevic would like to say a few words beforehand as well. And thank you again, uh, Chair Santos. Uh, the report in front of you just outlines um, an update to Council, or sorry, to Committee, uh, just to make sure that we're all aware, there is a public information, um, virtual public information session that will be held on June 22nd. And this is just to give an update uh, to Council to make sure that um, uh, everyone is aware of that. And all the long list as well as the short list of boards will be on there. Uh, and then we'll be reporting back to a committee at a later date before we get into the second public information uh, session that will be held in fall of 20, uh, 2020 this year. Thank you, uh, Chair. Thank you very much, Alex. Do any members of Council have any questions related to item 11.2.2? Questions or comments regarding the LRT extension study along Main Street? I see no questions on my board. Mr. Clerk, please do let me know if there are any. Otherwise, I will read the motion. Uh, number one, that the report titled Light Rail Transit Extension Study Along Main Street from Brampton Gateway Terminal to Brampton Go Station Shortlist of LRT Alignments, Wards 1, 3, and 4, uh, to the Committee of Council meeting June 3rd, 2020, be received. And number two, that the correspondence from the following report, 11.2.2, Light Rail Transit Extension Study Along Main Street from Brampton Gateway Terminal to Brampton Go Station, shortlist of LRT alignments, wards 1, 3, and 4, be received. Number one, from Chris Drew. Number two, from Sylvia Menezes. And number three, from Chris Be uh, Bejnar. Uh, Brampton residents and Chris Drew is uh, a volunteer from Fight Gridlock in Brampton. Anyone opposed? Oh, I have a question from Councillor Vicente. Councillor Vicente, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, just a quick question to staff. Uh, this report um, obviously deals with uh, one of our priorities uh, this term of council but it doesn't make mention on uh, our efforts to um, request or work with the province to move the gateway stop north of Steeles. I believe uh, the mayor uh, may have a motion in regards to that. Um, can you comment on what staff have done so far and where we stand on that portion of the LRT extension? Certainly. Uh uh, through the chair. So staff have been working with the uh, province and Metrolinx on um, the, the movement to the north side of Steeles along uh, from, the, from the south side. Uh, currently right now we've still been working with the province and uh, clearly um, those efforts to date um, have not yielded a, a positive outcome but uh, we haven't stopped and I think clearly uh, we're still continuing to work on, on uh, talking to the province and talking to Metrolinx to see if we can get um, uh, that relocated. But currently, right now, we don't have any traction, Councillor Vicente. Um, okay, so um, I see that the mayor has asked to speak to this, so I'll let him speak. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Brown. You're next. Yes, um, I wanted to, um, I think Peter Fay or Alex have a motion that we're going to put forward. Um, <laughs> We're making a lot of progress with the Premier's office uh, and Metrolinx on having the stop on the north side of the of the street. Um, I think from a transportation safety point, this is very important. And a number of the downtown councillors um, have uh, raised this as, as well. And I think it's a legitimate uh, concern. So um, the motion, uh, can we get it on the screen? There it is. Okay. Madam Staff Chair, it's on the screen in red. Work on the design of the LRT stop north of Steeles uh, Avenue. Um, I believe the province is going to let us do this. I, I'm optimistic about that. So I want this to be in the motion so that as soon as we get the go ahead, um, that we uh, have a council motion authorized. Thank you, Mayor. Anything further on the amendment or the motion? Okay, so there is an amendment to the motion to include number two, that staff be directed to continue to work on the design for the LRT stop north of Steeles Avenue. Mr. Clerk, do I need to reread the motion or can we take it as is? You can take it as read, Madam Chair. 
Thank you very much. Do any members of council motion? If not, your vote will be counted in the affirmative. I see no opposition. That motion carries. The next item of the agenda is uh, councillor question period. Do any members of council have any questions related to this section of the agenda? I see no questions on the board. Next item is 11.6. Public question period. Mr. Clerk, do we have any questions coming from the public via email today in this section? Uh, yes, we do, Madam Chair. The first is from Sylvia Menezes Roberts, Brampton resident. In regard to item 11.2.1 uh, regarding the Brampton Transit Recovery Strategy, the media is reporting that earlier today, Mayor Brown said that on July 2nd, masks will be mandatory. Where is the staff recommendation or council motion? Is this being implemented via emergency powers? Um, I, We'll just say that uh, committee just passed a motion to actually make it mandatory. So that question has been addressed. The second is in regard to item 11.2.2 on the LRT extension. The LRT extension maps show the south tunnel entrance would be in the TRCA floodplain. Has the city met with the TRCA on this? And if so, what does what dates in 2020 has staff or council met with the TRCA regarding it? Thank you very much. Um, General Manager Maloyevich, do you have a response for that second question from Sylvia? Uh, thank you, uh, through you, Chair. The uh, the question, uh, we've been meeting with all stakeholders involved along that corridor, and, uh, including QCA. I don't have the exact dates that we met with them. Um, what I can say, though, is we can take all these um, delegations, comments, uh, and questions and incorporate them into our uh, public information uh, center that we're doing on June 22nd and have a broader response uh, to, to all of them at that time. Thank you very much. And I believe that's all the questions we have in this section from the public. The next item of the oh, agenda sorry, is Sorry, Madam the, Chair. Yeah, uh, there go was, ahead. There was a second person that did have a question. It's uh, from Chris Drew, Brampton resident. Uh, it's again in regard to item 11.2.2, the LRT extension study. Given that there could be a reasonable rationale why did the George Street Loop route path change from what Council and the public saw in July 2015, October 2015, and May 2019, compared to what was in the June 3rd, 2020 report? Will this be covered at the Town Hall meeting? Thank you. Alex, over to you again. Yeah, absolutely, through you, Chair. Um, again, we would take uh, these comments and definitely incorporate them into the Public Information Center again on June 22nd, and then we'll be formulating a response to all the inputs that we have uh, during that session and, and provide comments back to everyone. Thank you very much, Alex. So now the next item of the agenda is number 12, the Referred Matters List, which is published quarterly on a meeting agenda. Uh, do any members of Council have any questions regarding the Referred Matters List? I see no questions regarding that. The, ne the f next section is section 13, public question period. Mr. Clerk, do we have any questions from the public in this general public question period? Through you, Madam Chair, yes, we do. We have another question and, and the last one from Sylvia Menezes Roberts. Uh, it relates more to the, the mayor's general update on COVID-19 and what the municipality is doing. Uh, Brampton has a dire overcrowding situation in rooming houses. Most of these people are in the 20 to 29 age group. Does the city know how many of the cases are spreading in these tightly packed situations? You cannot social distance when there are 20 people in one house. Um, it's uh, maybe we can have Dr. Lowe uh, speak to that the next time uh, he's given an update to council, uh, but I would uh, share with, what, with you what he's told me that the outbreaks um, have not necessarily second suite uh, 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 second suite apartments. Uh, we, one of the challenges have been in workplace um, outbreaks um, where someone from a workplace goes home and they go home to a family where there's 15 people living uh, in the same residence. It tends to be multi-generational um, where uh, you have three generations living uh, together and that's created some clusters in, in Brampton that have contributed to our cases, um, but we also have um, parking lot uh, parties uh, and sporting um, breakout sporting events that have contributed to it. So the parking lot uh, 
parties Paul Morrison's team continue to dedicate efforts and resources uh, towards. I, I spoke pretty sternly about it in, in the media uh, myself. Uh, uh, frankly, it's reckless behavior. And we have had some breakout soccer games and cricket games. We issued nine fines last week for um, people playing cricket. Um, uh, we can't have team sports at this point. Uh, public health is telling us it, it's a manner in which the in which the virus can spread. And so we're, we're doing our best to try to control the spread of the virus in that 20 to 29 uh, demographic. Thank you, Mayor Brown. Um, okay, so no more for, no more questions, Mr. Clerk, from the public. Our no. next item of it. Our next item of business is item 14, closed session business. Before taking a vote to proceed into closed session, we have one item on today's agenda. Does the committee wish to move into closed session to consider this matter or remain in open session and take a motion to acknowledge the item and confirm the closed session direction to staff as set out in the closed session? Okay, I'm wondering if there's anyone who uh, wants to keep this in open. There is not. We are going to go into closed session. I have a motion by Councillor Pileshi to uh, proceed into closed session. Um, and the reason for that is uh, to, 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 a proposed or pending acquisition or disposition of land by the municipality or local board. Is there anyone opposed to this mo motion? Okay, looks like we're going into closed session. Mr. Clerk, how much time do you need? Uh, Madam Chair, 10 minutes, please. Okay, so we will resume into closed session via the conference call number set by the clerk by 345. Thank you very much. We'll see you on the call. And if everyone can just leave the Skype session, you can rejoin when we come back to open. Okay, perfect. So assuming that we are online, um, we have returned from the closed session business and um, for transparency, I will now report back on the item that we did discuss. The item was considered enclosed, and the item has been referred to Council next week. Uh, the next item of our agenda is adjournment. But before we adjourn, I think as Chair of Community Services, I wanted to give a very special shout out to our Fire Chief, Bill Boys, who is going into a delivery of a new baby tomorrow. And so we are all wishing him and the family very well and a safe and speedy delivery for tomorrow. We look forward to seeing the new member of the family and wishing you all the best during this time. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. So now we're on adjournment. Our last, um, the next meeting uh, is on Wednesday, June 17th at 1 p.m. I have a motion by Councilor Williams to adjourn today's meeting. That committee now adjourned to meet again for a regular meeting of committee on Wednesday, May 20, not May, uh, on, uh, in June, uh, Wednesday, June the 17th, 2020 at 1 p.m. or at the call of the chair. Is there anyone opposed to this motion? Otherwise your vote will be counted in the affirmative. I see no opposition. This meeting is adjourned. Everyone, please stay safe, stay healthy, and most importantly, stay home and practice safe. Physical distancing to help flatten the curve. Bye, everyone.